Just two things before I let you loose in this three or so hour video. Firstly, some of the guides like the Doomfist and Junker Queen one are a few months old, so I've cut and or added some additional stuff in. And secondly, I now offer coaching. Hopefully these high quality guides do show that I understand these heroes better than most, so if you want to get coaching, of which I already have a few customers, the link is down below. Anyways, I hope you enjoy. The big overarching fundamental of the new tank Doomfist, summed into three words, is surgical angled engages. Look to engage with your new reworked seismic slam or rocket punch from different angles in order to make your engage less telegraphed. Looking to either hard engage and go in deep with the rest of your cooldowns, including power block and getting that supercharger off, or doing a soft engage using your other mobility cooldown to escape. Skip to the combo section where I explain Doom's two main combos as simply as possible. Now onto the weapons and abilities. Doom's hand cannon, the shotgun sniper, makes Doomfist fire shotgun pellets from his hand that now deal reduced damage from 6 to 5 pellets in Overwatch 2, and the ammo regeneration rate has increased from 0 0.65 seconds, meaning that you almost get your ammo back twice as quick. Thankfully, nothing really massive has changed about Doom's hand cannon. The biggest change is that this will become your main primary source of damage rather than your abilities, so a key piece of advice, especially in combos, is to have good trigger discipline. This just means you take an extra half a second to readjust your crosshair so your shots actually hit your enemy rather than and your shots are being dumped into thin air. You'll also want to interweave your shots between your abilities, in which you'll most likely be doing this after your seismic slam, before your rocket punch, and before your power block. Doom's first ability, the Randy Orton special, makes Doomfist perform a slam that now deals a flat 50 damage, slowing enemies by 30%, and can also launch the player straight into the air. It no longer pulls enemies in, targeted and ground slams are no longer a thing, and seismic slam can also be cancelled. Now onto the bigger fundamentals with seismic slam. If the enemy team has low CC and you're targeting multiple enemies, engaging with the slam will be the most optimal. Conversely, if you're going against a team with higher amounts of CC and you're targeting a singular enemy, engaging with your punch, either from high ground, from an angle, or from both, that will likely be your safest approach. For example, here, Get Quick Don engages with his punch because he's targeting the Sojourn, eventually using a slam to escape. Conversely, Get Quick Done does the opposite here, slamming onto multiple enemies before quickly punching out. Note that in both examples, he engages from different angles to make his engage less telegraphed. I recommend checking out the combo section in this video. Essentially, the two combos that Get Quick Done just did were the second combo against high CC comps. For the penultimate tip, if you are punch engaging, look to slam back to high ground to engage from a different angle rather than disengaging away to main, as Spalo explains here. This is an Overwatch 1 clip, but the logic still firmly applies. A lot of the times, especially against a not very mobile composition, you do not want to be going back to your team. Because not only is it more dangerous, as we see here, you're also losing a significant amount of pressure. Like, look at this chat. What would be the best thing to do in this circumstance? Slam out here, go grab health back, rinse and repeat. The point being is that you know they do not have mobility. They cannot chase you down. Down, they cannot punish you so you need to continue to stay on the angle the problem here is if you punch and you slam back your team even if you get out alive what do you do now you have literally one option you have to flank through hotel and hope that nobody sees you so you were set up well against a composition that couldn't push you you engage, you scuff up your engage, and then instead of setting up again, you completely bail and die. Lastly, let's talk about slam cancels. Cancelling your slam is quite a niche thing to do, but I see three main uses. The first is to assassinate aerial targets, as I'm sure you've already seen, with people like Sumito and Get Quick Don managing to kill pharmacies seemingly out of nowhere. Obviously, to do this, just aim your slam vertically, cancel it when you're right next to that farer, then fire your hand cannon, finishing off with a punch if need be. The second use is if you think engaging is a bad idea, using your punch to get out. This can be due to poor positioning with your slam, maybe you time your engagement poorly so you think you're gonna feed, or whatever. And lastly, the third use is just for some map rollout stuff, and in the wise words of Spylo, you can cancel your slam high up in the air to then punch across certain geometry. Doom's second ability, One Punch Man, makes Doofus charge up his rocket punch, which now deals significantly less damage, no longer making him one punch man. Simply put, the maximum damage he can do has gone down from 250 to 70 damage, his charge time got buffed from 1.4 seconds to 1 second, you can hit multiple enemies with your punch, and the cooldown is now 3 seconds from 4 seconds. Thankfully, most of the tech surrounding Doom's punch has been retained, 
aside from the new ability to multi-punch, which I'll get onto later. For those new to Doomfist, you can conserve the momentum of your punch by jumping at any time, which you'll be using for mobility to get around the map. For some more advanced, but still relatively simple tech, the three main punches you need to know are turn punches, bounce punches, and diagonal punches. Here's myself, from my old Doomfist guide, going over all three, with a Kong Q clip interweaved as well. Moving on to the three main different types of punches. The first is the turn punch. This is turning your camera in the direction you want to move in during your punch animation. The use for this is to engage at an unexpected angle so you take less damage on engagement, and as a result, you're more likely to dodge CC abilities such as McCree's Flash or Honor Sleep. The second type of punch is a bounce punch. This is used to gain high ground without having to use your uppercut, or to set yourself up at a good angle for a slam uppercut combo. The last type of punch is the diagonal punch. Here's Kaku explaining what it is and two ways in which it can be utilized. Doomfist tech known as a diagonal punch, with a mixture of what we call kill spots, where the punch connects on an enemy against the wall, or a setup spot where you'd initiate with the punch to get some height before following up with a seismic or uppercut. If you want to know more about combos with Doomfist, do skip to that section. Doom's third ability, B-Tech Kinetic Grasp, is a brand new ability for Doomfist that reduces his damage from the front by 90%. If 100 damage is blocked, your next rocket punch is empowered. This increases your punch's damage and speed by 50%, meaning you now deal a maximum of 105 damage on punch. Your multi-punch hitbox is also increased, and if you hit a target into a wall, they are now stunned from 0.5 to 1 second. Note that damage, such as Diva's Bomb, Sojourn's Disruptor Shot, and Hanzo's Dragon Strike and more, still count to that 100 damage target, and Power Block does not block CC, meaning you can still get stunned by a Rhesus New Javelin or Arna Sleep Dart. The biggest qualm with Power Block is whether to use it proactively, meaning you use it first to try and get that super punch, or whether to use it defensively, meaning that you use it when you're getting pressured on your engagement. And my answer to that, which is pretty boring, is that it depends, which leads me very nicely onto the combo section of this video. Actually, just before I go into the combos, get quicked on just release some new tech with Doomfist's power block and how to charge it faster, so I'll play that clip here. But if you were to look down, you can actually expose your head, and exposing your character's head means you will be exposed to more damage, and being exposed to more damage means you can build your block even faster. Now onto the combos, of which I've devised two main ones centered around CC, thanks to the help of Spylo. The first one is low CC, which will be against most compositions. The general flow of this combo is to engage, then block, then engage or disengage, and if you choose engage, you'll then obviously disengage. Engage can either mean your seismic slam or your punch. Secondly, block obviously means your power block. Thirdly, engage means that you use your punch again, which should hopefully be supercharged, using your seismic slam to disengage. Fourthly, the reason why I say that you can swap engage and power block, i.e. using power block first instead of second, is, as Spyro says, it's pretty easy to charge it at a choke with some early poke. Here's a clip of Super TF, where he power blocks first, then engages with slam, then continues to engage with his supercharged punch, landing a free kill, and slotting that combo in the first section. As the last note, Meteor Strike can reset your cooldowns, meaning that you reset your combo. The second combo is against comps with more CC, like Orisa on a Sombra. If the Orisa has an absolute hate boner for you in particular, or if their honor is actually smart and saves Sleep Dart when you power block, getting away with the first combo becomes a lot more difficult. As a result, you basically just disengage almost immediately after you engage, looking to maybe power block at the end if you think you can get 100 damage to supercharge your punch, so your next engage is more lethal. For some visual examples of this, refer back to the two get quick done clips I used in the seismic slam section, where he either uses punch or is slam to engage, and the other ability to disengage. Before I end off, I have seen some dodgy advice about trying to dodge CC when you power block, but in reality, this isn't going to happen. You're just not going to consistently dodge Orisa Javelin or Arna Sleep Dart when you're power blocking in the middle of nowhere. Doom's Ultimate, the Terry Crew Special, <laughs> makes Doomfist fly up in the air and crash into the ground, dealing 300 damage in his inner ring, 100 to 15 damage in his outer ring with a half second cast time, and a 50% slow on enemies hit for 2 seconds. Meteor Strike is ultimately unchanged from how it was in Overwatch 1. Use it to escape danger, or cycle cooldowns to be more aggressive. Speaking of cycling cooldowns, a neat little tip with Meteor Strike is that you can now utilize the slow from your seismic slam to more easily land the damage and slow from your Meteor Strike. Here's some Meteor giving a visual example of that, also using that first combo of low CC as mentioned prior. So I punch them back just to buy time and back off to my supports. And while I back off to my supports, I then use my power block. So I power block, get it charged, 
I almost had my ultimate. I knocked them all into the wall to get my ult. Slam in first to slow them yet again. So they're going to be slowed down. And then use my ult on the slow targets to land on the Mei and the Lucio and kill them. Lastly, onto Doom's playstyle, timing, and compositions. Doom is a tank with extremely high mobility, but with moderately low sustain and very low range. This slots him into the archetype of a dive tank with broadly aspects, meaning that ideally, you'll be playing with teammates who also have high mobility and moderate sustain, such as Lucio, Moira, Tracer, Sombra, and Reaper, also known as Talon Dive or Korean Brawl in Overwatch 1. However, in solo queue environments, you'd be lucky to find anything resembling Talon Dive. As a result, you want to look for well-timed engages when your team is actually able to follow up on them, as Spino gives an example of here. Nice. I don't know that I would have committed my punch to here, but again, committing from the angle, and when are you doing it? Chat, when is he doing it? You see the timing here? Like, we're gonna give credit when credit is due. It's not perfect, but it's there. Look at this. Brilliant. Concave push on an angle. You take no damage on entry because you push quickly and off split from main, and you engage it on a right when your tanks are going in. Again, when I say follow up, I don't necessarily mean that they have to be hard diving with you. For example, it could be an Ash or a Hanzo taking an aggressive angle when you go in. I also want to quickly add in an excerpt about Chips and Spilo talking about Doomfist's assassination playstyle, which you do against immobile heroes like Zen or Widow, and Doomfist's disruption playstyle, which you do against immobile heroes like Kiriko, Lucio, or Tracer. What if they were playing a composition that you're seeing a lot of nowadays with these Kirikos and these Lucios and, and Tracers, and, and there isn't a target that feels like an, an easy squishy to assassinate? I think generally you try not to use your block as much and just try to be as aggressive as possible with your cooldowns trying to keep your passive working all the time, trying to hit as many people with your slam and disrupt as much as possible, rather than just sort of trying to farm an empowered punch and then kill a squishy. So against compositions that don't have a lot of squishies that you can easily assassinate, they trade that out for not having a lot of damage that can kill you easily. Yes, exactly. It's generally, you don't have a comp that does both those things. You know, you either have a comp like a Zenyatta and like, you know, Hanzo. You tend to notice that your empowered punch gets farmed very easily, which means you can end up assassinating people more. Whereas the comps the tracers and etc um tend not to get your empowered punch farmed as much uh, which means you have to sort of not rely on that as much lastly before i end off i did talk about wanting to take off angles and flanks for less telegraphed engages but playing against comps with high mobility such as tracer sombra diva is one of the biggest challenges with doomfist especially in overwatch 2 considering sombra's rework so here's spyro detailing how you can adapt around this with a brief note for myself at the beginning of the clip. If I'm Doomfist and I and I punch out of a choke off into a flank, well then now that tracer can just immediately say, oh, hi Doomfist, I'm gonna go duel you. And you don't have punch. And we already talked about how Doomfist isn't very good one-on-one -on -one against those heroes with or without his cooldowns. So like as Doomfist, what do you do about that? And number one, taking less greedy flanks. Like you can't hard flank, like go all the way behind the enemy team if they're playing like Tracer Sombra. That's not likely to work very well. So a lot of time you kind of have to time your speed splits really well and you have to try and avoid running into the tracer echo like play in angles and short angles that aren't completely isolated so in other words like taking a little bit off right and then engage from here or a little bit off from here or maybe go high ground right because tracer doesn't have as good high ground mobility as you well that's the guide this is the best way to play D.Va and Overwatch 2. D.Va has three main playstyles centered around controlling or dishing out aggression. You either mark, dive, or peel. Look to either mark lethal DPS in aggressive positions like Sojourn, Soldier, Echo, Cassidy, or Ash. Look to dive squishy isolated targets like Zen, Bap, Widow, or Hanzo. Or look to peel your own backline against heroes like Genji, Tracer, and Doomfist. The fact that D.Va has great matchups against all the DPS heroes in Overwatch is what makes us such a great dynamic and versatile pick. D.Va's weapon, the worst shotgun in Overwatch, makes D.Va shoot her twin short range rotating cannons, dealing up to 22 damage per blast a 40% movement penalty, coupled with a short fall off range starting at 10 meters, alongside infinite ammo. Just like with most weapons in the game, there isn't anything too complex about the cannons. You'll be using them at range just for poke damage, and to combine them up close for the quickest time to kill. Spy chucking is really the only unique piece of advice for Divas Blasters. Because you have infinite ammo, you can search for Sombras with your cannons due to them having a widespread, being hit scan, and having infinite ammo. An example of spy checking would be this spot here on Umbani first point defense. I also want to point out the tracking and aim you'll need up close. You'll be in hugging distance a lot of the time on D.Va, especially when diving or marking enemies. Unlike Tracer or Reaper, you don't have to worry about trigger discipline or pacing your shots 
because you do have infinite ammo, but just note that the tracking can be intensive. Lastly, and this is to do with Diva's mech, please do not take too much damage before the start of a fight, because you'll limit your options mid-fight for what you can do. Key thing that I'm seeing is using resources way too early, like before the fight even begins, and then yep. when the fight actually starts, we're at half HP or even lower, like in that last case right there. We have basically no DM. I mean, I agree. I don't have anything more to add. I think it's micro missiles, the matrix, the booster management, the HP management. They're, they're, it's literally, we're not even in a position to where we can actually offing even if we wanted to. You're at 150 HP, you don't have boosters, you don't have micro missiles, and you're missing half your matrix. If you try an off angle in that situation, you're gonna get instantly demacked and you're gonna die. Diva's first ability, the Boosty Boys, makes Diva fly at over double her normal speed for two seconds with a four second cooldown. Let me just get this out of the way 95% of the time, you'll be using your boosters for mobility, either to pressure the enemy team or to protect slash peel your own team. Since this is so intertwined with the playstyle section, I'll cover some of the less specific, more general rule of thumbs for using your boosters here. Look to boost to high ground. The reason for this is for awareness and for scouting purposes, as Sparlow explains here. Who on the enemy team is playing aggressive? Arisa. Is there anybody else in the enemy team that's playing more aggressive or might be playing more aggressive soon? Do you see how hard it is for you to tell right now? That's why we go to high ground. Because as a D.Va player, you need to make that assessment accurately and quickly. And you cannot make that assessment with where you're at right now, can you? It's very hard to see. So you go to high mm -hmm. ground. Now what do you see? Or what do you not see? You don't see anyone on flank. No flank. There's nobody here. There's nobody here. There's nobody here or here. There's nobody here. Okay. At the very least, it gives you the information that you need. The second reason, linked to the prior one, is to either pressure or peel. For example, let's say you boost her up to high ground on kings or third points. You can either look to pressure enemy DPS or the enemy backline, or to either peel for your own team. Now which option do you choose, I hear you ask? What's my target priority? Well, for those who've watched my stuff already, you'll know that target priority comes down to who's the easiest to kill and or who's the most dangerous, and that, for D.Va, can be broken down to aggression, isolation or distance. For example, if you see a Sojourn or Genji being very aggressive, then probably target them because they're extremely dangerous and relatively easy to kill. If you see an isolated Zen instead, then go for the Zen because he's extremely easy to kill. But, if that Zen is playing from a long distance, then he's not very easy to kill, and it's actually pretty dangerous for you to booster at him from this kind of distance. And for reference, if they're all clumped up, meaning none of them are isolated or are playing aggressively, just pick your poison at that point, drop off high ground, blast them up close, and fly back to high ground. Hopefully that wasn't too much, so you might need to rewatch that, but if you literally just master what I said and nothing else in this guide, I unironically have no doubt that you will at least be diamond if not masters. Now here's a visual example of what happens when you don't choose a target who's easy or dangerous to kill. You're on a Genji that's not aggressive, you're allowing all these people to have something to shoot, right? When they've not even earned it. You see that? They've not even committed. They're just sitting back here and poking you out. And that's how you get demapped. A lot of your success on D.Va and Zarya and even Sigma is going to be your diagnosis off of who is going aggressive and then punishing that person. And if you misdiagnose, you die. Lastly, a niche use of boosters is for the knockback to knock heroes off high ground. Here's a very old clip from my original D.Va guides. Now he's created a lot of space. Now he's pushed up here, you guys have, kite, kite, have to guide back a little bit. Your snipers don't have as much room, whereas if he's on the ground, your snipers can still use the shield and poke off the D.Va and, you know, no problem. Now Genji gets to walk up a lot, like everyone gets to take a lot of space. And you guys lost control of the platform. See, he's been zapping everyone, like he's probably up to like 40% of his primal now. D.Va's second ability, the mid-missiles, makes her fire 18 missiles, dealing a total of 126 damage with a cooldown of 7 seconds. Fortunately, your micro missiles serve one purpose, which is to deal as much burst damage as possible. Here's the combo to do so. Firstly, use the boosters to close the distance. Fire your cannons to add a bit of poke damage. Thirdly, fire your micro missiles when you're close to the target, so they actually hit. Lastly, cancel your boosters up close and melee to finish them off. This should easily melt any squishy character if aimed and performed correctly. Now, what I'm more concerned about is your, your resource management here. Like, how were you able to get in here? You should also have your micro missiles here, to be honest with you. Mm. You should have mm. saved it for close distance and i also think like micro missiles here i think it's good because as at this range but remember it would not be good at this range right yes it's just a very very subtle difference but it's important the last use which is more niche is to multitask your missiles alongside your dm most commonly this would be up against forest barrage a reaper death blossom or a cassidy high noon the extra 100 or so damage can really make a big difference diva's third ability the three second transcendence 
makes Diva activate a forward-facing targeted array to catch and eliminate projectiles out of the air. It lasts 3 seconds with a 10 meter range and a cooldown of 1 second. It takes 6 seconds to fully charge your Matrix from zero. Matrix is one of the most flexible and powerful abilities in the game, so let's break it down into a few key uses. The first common use of Matrix is to use it selfishly when boosting or diving in to just absorb damage for yourself on entry. So, would have liked matrix on entry at that distance mm -hmm. so then then you can close the distance which is right you're not not your effective range right so i know it doesn't feel like a lot but you you did take about 150 damage close to 200 damage from just the zen you can also use it when taking off angles as mentioned prior with your boosters just to stay on that off angle for longer high ground on kings or third point would be a good example the second common use of matrix is to eat instances of projectile cleave damage such as fire strike dynamite damage orb or nades with Nade and Dynamite especially, it's a lot easier to eat these projectiles from high grounds because you can actually see where they're coming from. Obviously, this goes without saying, but don't eat pointless spam damage just before a fight begins since you won't have your DM or defense matrix for when you actually need it. Thirdly, try not to panic a matrix when a teammate is out of position or is being dove. For instance, say your Zen is getting dove by a Tracer, Genji or Doomfist. Time your Matrix to the beat of Genji's rate of fire, Matrix after Doom punches or seismic slams since he'll be shooting, etc. There will of course be niche uses of Matrix to eat ultimates and whatnot, but generally speaking, you'll either be using Matrix for yourself or for a teammate in danger. Diva's ultimate, Kim Jong-un's best friend, makes Diva self-destruct our mech, dealing up to 1000 damage in a 20 meter radius with a 3 second fuse. Thankfully, this is the part of my guide which doesn't really change from Overwatch 1. In terms of tech and mechanics, there's five main types of Diva Bomb that vary with how commonly they're used. The first is the Angled Bomb, which is boosting in the air at a 45 degree angle, then releasing the bomb when just over a quarter of your boosters have been used. This serves the purpose of zoning the area before engagement, to provide map control, and catching any squishies by surprise, with a common example being on Gibraltar Attack on third points. I also highly recommend the workshop code BBSSO, present in Karku's workshop video to see the radius, placement and angling of your bombs. Note that you can also skim your bombs across rooftops and angled surfaces which decrease the amount of time the enemy team have to react to the bomb and increases the likelihood that you catch a split off targets. And also if you do bomb you need like a little better placement because this this placement really isn't that good. Like it lands in a corner so it doesn't even split. You don't need kills but you need to at least split someone so if your team is pushing in you can catch a target that is split up or at least force out an ultimate. But the way you put it in the corner, it's very easy for all of them to just fall back to that corner and shield it off. Slide it off corners here, you can slide it off corners there. Next up is the nosedive bomb. Simply boost into the ground and immediately bomb. This serves the purpose of bombing as quickly as possible by not spending time using your boosters whilst minimizing how far the bomb travels. Kinda useful for punishing an overextending team on a map that's not very open. If the map was very open, think Jungle Town first point, then the third bomb may be of use. The air bomb. Simply fly vertically or at a slight lateral angle and detonate your bomb when roughly half your boosters have been depleted. This just serves the purpose of zoning as much ground as possible and covering as much area as there is. The stationary bomb. This is just pressing Q and standing still. I don't think I need to explain how to do this type of bomb. This just serves the purpose of remaking while simultaneously risking anybody who tries to enter the AoE or the area of effect of your bomb. Lastly, the drop bomb. This is bombing at the edge of a high ground, then shuffling the bomb with your own hitbox off the edge which should catch people by surprise who are under the bomb. A great example of this would be on the airship on Watchpoint Gibraltar. Now onto a few uses. This just means bombing when the enemy Sombra EMPs, when the enemy Zarya Gravs, etc. You're essentially zoning the enemy aggression. Inting bomb. This just means you choose a squishy target, boost straight onto them with micro missiles and whatnot, and you try your best to delete them. It doesn't matter if you get demeked, since that's when you'll bomb. The issue with this bomb of course is that it's very aggressive and risky so make sure your team match that aggression to get the most out of this. Bomb engaging early. This is a bomb usage I see often. A major downside to bomb engaging early is that you're left without matrix and if you're away from the main fight to get a good angle for your bomb this leaves the enemy DPS particularly a reaper or even a pharmacy coming from an off angle to completely switch and carry the fight in the space of just a few seconds. They're in a devolved fight, they're up two or three, like not just that you're wasting the bomb, the fight's already won. In fact, bombing here is worse than not bombing. No matrix. And why is that bad? It gives them a chance to clutch, exactly. This son of a gun right here is 93% on Death Blossom. If he has Death Blossom right now, your entire team is dead. You give the Reaper an opportunity to clutch. You have no idea how incredibly lucky you were there. 
Bomb engages are okay, but your team has to understand that there's no matrix and you can play around. Bombing at engagements. As with any offensive ultimates, you want to use it at engagements or during the midfights. This is because cooldowns are used, which means attention is drawn elsewhere from your bomb, increasing the chance of your bomb getting value. A zoning bomb. This is of course one of the most popular uses of bomb, to buy your team space. If you're desperate, use this when attempting to get through a hard choke like on Dorado first points. This should pick up a few kills in the lower ranks and at least forces everyone to take cover. I'm still not a big fan of this use, so just like the inting bomb, your team also needs to match that aggression. Bombing for damaging shields. Apparently this is a thing that people do at low ranks, please don't do this. Now onto the playstyle section. Diva is such a versatile character that the way you play depends upon your team comp. However, there are three key playstyles which I'll cover with Diva, and then I'll cover the more niche stuff. The first playstyle is peeling, meaning to protect and help your squishy teammates. The key thing here is the range at which you play with regards to your team. You don't want to be stacked, but you don't want to be playing so far away that you can't fly to help your team. Here's an example on Blizzard World first point defense. Here, you're within a decent range to help any member of your team, whether that be on high ground, your support's playing back, or if your DPS want to take a flank or a duel. However, you don't want to play so far back that you won't be able to do the next playstyle, diving. Continuing from the Blizzard World example, this is just playing like a Winston essentially. If you have a few divers ready, or if the enemy team walk into your space, pick a squishy target, fly onto them, and delete them. Referring back to that aggression, isolation, distance thing. The most important thing here is timing. Make sure your DPS, whether they be flankers or not, can actually see and help you diving in. Even better, if a target is isolated, dive onto them, as Spyro gives an example of here. Is there anybody in the enemy team that's going hyper-aggressive that you should have controlled? BAP. Right. BAP is the most aggressive, most isolated target, so who's, what's going to create more space? You shooting here, or you could or beating, him, beating the crap out yeah. of this guy? Right. Now, I don't even know if you can trade, but you could force shift could have forced lamp and you would have lamp, easily survived right. and remember what would have been the enemy team's response at this point in time probably back right or at least attempt to peel right or some form of distraction which at the same time would have allowed your team to back up safely so right now i know what you're doing you're peeling which is fine but i think the more direct or indirect and more valuable form of peeling would have been a little bit more pressure on the more isolated target now onto marking whilst there is some overlap between marking and diving the key difference is, is that with marking, you're looking to control enemy aggression, but with diving, you're looking to exert your own aggression. If that Hanzo is missing, or you don't hear him shooting from main, red, like, alarm bells need to be going off in your head. You don't have to stay up here, necessarily. Maybe you're like, I'm scared I'm gonna get spammed out or something. But you better yeah. be aware. And if there's anybody flanking behind, you better be the first person to know and the first person to react to it. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That is yes. what your hero does. And if you get stuck, like, right there, this is so crucial. Like this, this is this is Overwatch 2 right here. This mm -hmm. this becomes even more important in Overwatch 2. Back to Blizzard World, a DPS taking a flank on your backline is an aggressive angle that needs to be controlled, and is a perfect time to segue into marking pharmacy. Especially for console players, pharmacy can be a tough threat to deal with because they can off angle from any position on the map, as Spalo explains here. Pharmacy is the epitome of an off angle DPS, but she can off angle from legitimately anywhere. Like she can go behind you, she can go above you, she can go to your far right, your far left. Like, have you ever seen Overwatch League, like Volksky Industries' first attack? They'll send pharmacy all the way around spawn choke and start shooting them from behind. The reason Divas prioritize on pharmacy is because she's going to be the most lethal off angle threat. She's going to be off angling 24 7. The way to deal with pharmacy is to spot where the farmer may be aggressing onto a squishy hero and then marking that farmer. For example, on a pool village, if Farah decides to concuss over the rooftops and dive your hitscan, that's the perfect opportunity for you to fly towards the farmer, DM her rockets, and land some missiles up close. The last thing I want to talk about is scouting. This is just seeing where the enemy team are at the beginning of a fight. You can scout, you can either either fly up and look or you can go towards the right side. You can see the spawn from there and then you can call a little earlier for your team which way they're coming, whether they're coming top, whether they're coming main, whether they're coming right side, because then you guys can position yourselves accordingly and beat them to the corner. Now into Diva's tank matchups. Normally I break these down individually, but I'd like to group up some of the tanks into the Poke Brawl hybrid matchup featuring Sigma, Reinhardt, Ramatra, Orisa, Junker Queen, and Zarya, and into the dive matchups featuring Wrecking Ball, Winston, and Doomfist. This is because your playstyle against these type of heroes are very similar. Diva vs the Poke Brawl tanks. These are map dependent matchups for Diva. Funnily enough, a lot of Diva's matchups are quite map dependent, I think. Maps with the vital high grounds like King's or Third Point are good examples where Diva thrives over these brawly tanks who lack vertical mobility. But on more linear maps, 
or in situations where your mobility isn't really needed, like in Coliseo, the matchup can tilt in favour of these heroes. Basically, fight for the space around the tanks rather than fighting the tanks themselves, apart from Sigma maybe because he's quite squishy. Diva vs the dive tanks. Against these individually, in a 1v1, of course Diva wins, especially against Winston. That's a no-brainer. But whilst Diva is a better duelist than each of these heroes, they often thrive when fighting clumps of enemies. The difference between Diva and Winston is when Winston is in this position here, where you were, he's much, much better than you. And everybody's clumped up, but the problem is, is that Winston's a lot worse at getting everybody to clump up like you. He's not as good at controlling those off angles early on. And there's time to kill, time to dive, Winston's better. But in the control phase, the pre-fight phase, the setup phase, the, then you're just significantly better. You'll often be making a choice as to whether you peel off the dive or to mark enemy DPS. For example, on Blizzard World, if Ball or Doomfist dives your backline with support, with support from an enemy Ash or Sojourn, you might want to mark them because of how lethal they are. But if Ball has Trace or Genji follow up, your Zen or Ana better be getting that DM. If they're really coordinated and say they're playing Ball, Sojourn, Tracer, Lucio, then you'll have to make a choice as to whether to mark the Sojourn or to peel off the Ball Tracer. And this just comes down to whoever you think is more lethal and whether you're running heroes like Kiriko, Bap, Brick and Moira, who can survive way more than heroes like Zen or Mercy. This is where the cream of the crop of D.Va players are distinguished, but in ranked, even at GM or even in top 500, you won't need to worry about this. Not to mention Ball and less so Doomfist aren't great picks in ranked right now, so you shouldn't need to worry about this too much. The final matchup is D.Va vs Roadhog. Obviously be within range to DM hooks, and once their hog is no longer a threat, or is exhibiting any aggression, you can divert your attention to the other playstyles mentioned prior. Well that's it for the video. If there's one thing you take away from this video, it's this. Junker Queen is a hero with high sustain, low range, and low mobility, functioning as an alternative to Reinhardt with lower durability but higher damage. Look to either out-duel the enemy in close range because of your very high damage, or to out-sustain enemy dive and poke tanks, such as Doomfist and Sigma respectively, with your commanding shout. Junker Queen's weapon, Scout's TF2 Scattergun, is a short range weapon that deals 80 damage on body shot with 6 shots in a clip. Nothing much to say here since you'll be using this to get some chip damage in from range and to deal some meaningful damage up close. The one notable thing that I will say is to make sure you have a full clip when you are brawling and pulling off your combos, which I will get onto with the other abilities respectively. Also ensure you have good trigger discipline when firing your scattergun up close. Likewise to Reaper, your pellets are hitscan and enemies move faster relative to how close up on screen they are, so taking the extra half a second to readjust your crosshair to land a juicy meat shot could be the difference between landing an elimination or not. Jungle Queen's first ability, a B Tech Boomerang, makes Jungle Queen toss out a knife that deals 80 damage on hit and when retracted can normally pull an enemy 10 meters. It also deals 15 bleed damage over 2.7 seconds. Speaking of bleed, I'll just get this out the way, 100% of the bleed damage you do returns as healing in the passive adrenaline surge or I, I don't remember. As Tickety says here, not all bleed damage is created equal, with your Jagged Knife dealing 5.5 healing per second through bleed, Carnage dealing 19 healing per second, and Rampage dealing 21 healing per second for every target hit. For reference, the bleed healing does indeed stack, so you can potentially get some Mercy Beam healing when stacking all three abilities together. With Jagged Blade in particular, I'll start off with combos. The most complex one, popularised by Get Quick Don, is to shoot, knife, shoot, retract the knife, shoot, Use your carnage swing, shoot, and melee. You might need to rewatch that like I did many times, but in total, that's four shots from your scattergun, three interactions with your jagged blade, and one use of your carnage swing. The more simple combo that you'll likely be doing is to simply throw the blade, retract it, and land a shoot plus melee combo. This does anywhere between 190 and 220 damage with bleeds included. Keep in mind, there's a decent amount of leeway with headshots as well. In terms of broader uses, the most obvious one that comes to mind is to use it like a road or cook. However, you will quickly find out that this use only goes so far. Yes, there is some tech for you to increase the pull distance of 10 meters, for example, meleeing when pulling an enemy towards you will launch them an extra 7 meters, and pulling an enemy from high ground or low ground when they have the knife stuck in them will increase the distance they travel, but in general, pulling like a road or cook to get off your overcomplicated combo just isn't worth it. However, as Stickety describes here, you'll mainly be using your Dragon Blade to chase down isolated enemies, which is especially useful in 1v1s. Once you're able to get onto a target, 
sticking them with the knife ensures that they have no way out no matter what they do. The 80 damage it does as well is more than enough to help you secure kills sometimes, but if they are able to survive your burst damage, having the knife stuck in them will mean that you can pull them back into you and keep them within melee range for a lot longer than if you didn't have this in your kit. Another use is a more defensive one against dive heroes by retracting the blade as soon as the enemy dive hero tries to escape, for example, pulling a Winston back when he tries to jump away. Aside from that, the blade does have a slight arc and it's harder to hit than it looks, so perhaps some custom game modes of just throwing and landing the knife, or some practice in unranked or hopefully competitive when it drops, can help you land the blade more consistently. Jungle Queen's second ability, B-Tech Reinhammer, makes Jungle Queen slash an axe across an enemy for 90 damage, dealing 55 bleed damage over 2.9 seconds with an 8 second cooldown. The main combo for Carnage is to use it first, then follow up with the Scattergun, and then with a melee. This in total does 200 damage, but this doesn't include the added bleed or any headshots, so there is some leniency. Because of the long cast time of the axe, you'll likely be wanting to start up the animation around a corner, and as soon as Jungle Queen slashes it across the screen, you peek the corner. The axe functions very similarly to Reinhardt's hammer, as you're able to cleave multiple enemies at once by turning the direction of your camera. In terms of use, it's pretty basic and simple. Use the axe in the mid fight to build up and stack your bleeds, and in a close range duel, despite the long cast time from axe, the large reliable hitbox can help you confirm damage unlike throwing the jagged blades. Junker Queen's third ability, Cry of Fear, adds 200 overhealth to Junker Queen, 100 overhealth to those around Junker Queen, as well as a 30% speed boost for 4 seconds, paired with a lengthy 11 second cooldown. The safest use for commanding Chao is to use it defensively. If you use this ability too early on, in order to close the distance, you won't have it active for when you truly need the extra 200 HP to survive any damage. Keep in mind, Junker Queen is a more squishy tank than Doomfist, with no armor, no damage mitigation, the lowest HP pull in the tank category, and little mobility. The 30% speed buff is also not as much as you think. Whilst it is noticeable, Lucio's passive speed aura is 25% for reference. Speaking of Lucio, the speed auras from both heroes do indeed stack, which I'll get onto later in the last section. The other use is for aggression, which is done when your team is planning to utilize that extra 100 HP, for example, during a Genji Dragonblade. However, as Temporal explains here, there are some limitations with using commanding chart aggressively outside of when Junker Queen is brawling. The lack of any sort of barrier or defense matrix, anything like that to really help her team rotate. The closest thing she has is her commanding shout. That's obviously really good, but you can't use it in ticks like Sigma, Diva, Reinhardt could use their abilities to help their team rotate without it being an all in. And she wants to have her commanding shout for the actual brawl itself. She kind of needs that. Junker Queen's ultimate, the windmill, makes Junker Queen charge forward, wounding enemies for 4.8 seconds, applying 100 bleed damage alongside an anti-nade effect. It goes without saying, but this ultimate appears to be very strong due to the anti-effect. As a result, it seems best to use this to initiate a fight, especially when trying to close the distance, as you can then start stacking bleeds very early on, and, as mentioned prior, you can use your commanding shout to sustain in the fight further, or to safely disengage as you'd be deep in enemy territory. The only thing to look out for are for cleansing abilities, such as Reaper or Moira Fade, or Zarya Bubbles, which can render your ultimate null, so in that case, it's best to use the ultimate mid-fight when some of these abilities are on cooldown. There's also some more glide tech shown in the background by Get Quicked On, which is used to avoid getting stunned out of your wind-up time at the start of your ultimate, and to also decrease the amount of damage taken. Onto the final section of playstyle, synergies, and compositions. Coach Spike released a very good video simplifying Overwatch down to two matchups, frontline versus angles, get him to 100 subs whilst you're at it. Essentially, teams with a stronger frontline, think of comps with high sustain, such as Reinhardt and now Junker Queen, will look to either run it down and rush as normal, or to deny angles. In comparison, teams that can exert better angle pressure, think of comps with high mobility and or range, such as Wrecking Ball or Sigma, will want to either take angles or to disrupt the enemy team's rush. Here's Spike giving an example in 6v6 Overwatch, but the concept still very much applies to 5v5. If both teams play stacked, then the Ryan team will easily win, while the ball team is much more comfortable when controlling angles. So we have frontline versus angles. What do both teams have to do now? When holding a position or pushing into enemy space, Ryan Lucy comp has to focus on denying flankers first, 
and later if they are forced out or ball chaser are still rotating there can be an opportunity to run down the break zone. but Ryan Lucio are also very dependent on CDs and ults if they don't have any CDs left their front line is crumbling and running it down or continuing it is quite impossible so with Jungle Queen up against a hero like Reinhardt because you have a weaker front line due to no armor a low HP pull and no massive 1200 HP shield you'll want to take angles around the Reinhardt using your Scattergun, Jacket Blade, and Axe to win out duels or to disrupt the enemy rush using your commanding shot to kite back. For example, on Rialto first point attack, you can take angles with the high ground or run underneath or get ready to kite back with your commanding shouts. What about Junker Queen up against more mobile, dive your compositions up against Winston and Doomfist? Well, because Junker Queen has a higher sustain through her commanding shouts and passive bleed, you'll be looking to play the frontline matchup. Similar to the Reinhardt vs Ball matchup Coach Spike brought up earlier, you might look to deny angles before running it down, using your Jagged Blade to pull back enemy dive heroes such as Winston to help win that frontline matchup. Likewise, in the poke matchup against heroes like Sigma Zen, you want to play the frontline matchup to run it down. Because I've already talked about some issues with Joker Queen's lack of mobility when compared to Reinhardt, there could perhaps be a fix with Lucio Brig. Nessa, a professional Overwatch coach, stated himself that Junker Queen had looked the best with Lucio Brig in Tier 2 Overwatch contenders. Histon Paul explaining why that might be the case. When you look at Lucio's speed plus Junker Queen's speed, that's a lot of speed that you can stagger there. When you look at Lucio's aura healing plus Brig's inspire healing plus Junker Queen's commanding shout that's a lot of sustain that applies to everyone if they're stacked together the other really cool thing that her commanding shout does is it solves a lot of the burst issues with lucio and briggs's supports in the past their burst would have been limited to a repair pack and amp but when you have junker queen you can give an extra 100 health to your other players that can solve some of the burst issues that come in is there still a vulnerability with this core to things like widow pharah ash heavy direct damage like that yeah yeah, there absolutely is. But this sort of comp just completely ignores cleave damage. It doesn't really get chipped down all that effectively from light damage. Well, that's the guide. If you take one thing away from this video, it's this. Orisa is a defensive cyclical brawl hero. This means that against the most compositions, you'll be looking to cycle your cooldowns to brawl the enemy team, using your spear spin to engage and your fortify to disengage, utilizing your javelin to find surgical picks onto enemy squishy heroes. Orisa's primary fire, spam, makes Orisa fire a bunch of projectiles dealing 12 damage and firing at 600 RPM dealing a total of 120 DPS. The projectiles do have fall off damage and will take 2 seconds to recharge after being overheated. The most important thing to mention with your gun is the range and sightlines you play. Because the rest of Orisa's kit is quite brawly, meaning you want to get up close, you don't want to get too close that you might as well be playing Reinhardt. In the wise words of Spylo, former Overwatch League coach, you'd be playing longer sightlines against a Reinhardt or dive composition and shorter sightlines against more ranged or spammer compositions like Sigma. This is evidenced by Mirror's Orisa on the Vancouver titans which i'll be referring to a lot where you can see that he plays a far enough distance so hardy is forced to commit if he wants to land any hammer swings but mirror is close enough that he can land meaningful damage another example would be on route 66 first point attack where against reinhardt you'd want to be keeping a decent amount of distance from him but if you're playing up against sigma you'd want to reach the high ground and force a brawl and that's the versatility in playing orisa aside from that Obviously don't overheat your gun because the 2 second wait isn't worth it. You'll cleanse most of the overheat by pacing your shots anyways. Orisa's first ability, the spinny boy, makes Orisa spin her energy javelin in front of her, dealing 100 damage in under 2 seconds as well as increasing Orisa's movement speed by 50% and by 20% 2 seconds after the ability is used. It's also on a relatively short 7 second cooldown. The main use behind Spear Spin is to engage aggressively. You deny most forms of damage in the game, meaning you can get close and personal without too much risk. You'll see this time and time again in the Overwatch League, with Mirror using a Spear Spin aggressively, even into a hero like Reinhardt, and then disengages with his Fortify, or someone engaging aggressively with the spear spin onto the squishy enemy backline, then using his fortify to sustain. Other uses of spear spin are more niche. One of them is to try and push enemies into your team. The reason why these uses are so niche is that you'll only be able to do this if you don't have to use spear spin to get into close range in the first place. For example, here, the Florida Mayhem use speed boost to close the distance, meaning someone doesn't have to use spear spin. As a result, he uses it to spin the Zarya out of the immortality field, landing the kill. With Kiriko in the game, the same sort of logic will apply for Kitsune Rush, 
where you can rush in, closing the distance without having to use Spear Spin to do so. Another use is to isolate squishies and to force duels upon them. This will likely be in the mid fight when you're already engaged or if you see an opportunity where you can strike. For example, if you're playing up against a Winston with a squishy backline, if the Winston jumps your backline, you may want to trade out and to look and find an opportunity onto the enemy Zen or Ana. Even Spyro advises this when saying that Arisa can play super aggressively against squishy backlines, and we even see this in Overwatch League when someone is aggressively engaging onto Vancouver's squishy backline and to a lesser extent, Mirror when he's trying to engage aggressively onto Gladiator's backline. And he does end up getting the honour. However, could argue that Gladiator's backline isn't squishy enough due to the Lucio, meaning Mirror could have bullied Reinhardt on the Winston instead. Another use of Spear Spin is to rotate in open space, but I'll get onto that later. Lastly, one key tip is that if you are already engaged, do not bother using Spear Spin, and instead, you might want to save it as a disengagement tool. Here, Crowley from the Powers Eternal uses Spear Spin unnecessarily, meaning that eventually he's overwhelmed by the angles from the Vancouver Titans and is unable to make a retreat. If he had saved Spear Spin, he could have made a run back. Arisa's second ability, the Olympic Thrower, makes Arisa throw a javelin, dealing 60 damage on impact and an extra 40 damage if they hit a wall. The javelin moves at the same speed as Kiriko's kunai's and can deal up to half a second of full stun, paired with a 6 second cooldown. The main use of your javelin is to fish for mid fight picks onto squishy heroes. The reason why your target priority is onto these squishy heroes rather than tanks is twofold. Squishy heroes are easier to kill than tanks if you land the javelin and they're typically more dangerous. If you land a javelin on a 200 HP squishy hero, you can half their HP immediately and you can follow up with some easy headshots, even landing the kill, thus winning the team fight. Here's a perfect example in the Overwatch League where this could have been done. Mirror decides to use his javelin on the enemy Reinhardt, which doesn't really do much, and as a result, Sparker finds a one shot unpunished. If Mirror had used his javelin on Sparker instead, not only would Sparker not have landed the one shot, but he could have very well died, especially if Mirror followed up with the spear spin, then disengaged with his fortify, which I discussed earlier. However, javelin can also be a defensive tool. For example, if you're getting rushed out by a Reinhardt, simply throwing your javelin at him will at the very least force him to put up his shield, and if not, he'll get thrown backwards. Alternatively, if a Winston is beaming you and there's no other DPS around who you could realistically throw and land your javelin at, then getting the extra 60 damage plus done is kind of worth it. I will say this though, if Winston dives your backline with the Tracer, use the Spear Spin on the Winston and the Javelin on the Tracer. The reason for this is that the 60 damage or 100 damage will do a lot more to a Tracer than a Winston, and Winston can't really avoid your Spear Spin unlike the Tracer. The other uses of Javelin, which you've probably already heard of from other mediocre guides, is for the stun, in order to stop things like Coalescence, High Noon, etc. Arisa's third ability, Invincible, makes Orisa, well, invincible. In all seriousness though, it gives Orisa an additional 125 HP, and gives her 40% damage reduction, and makes her immune to headshots, and reduces the heat generated by her gun by 50%. It also has a 12 second cooldown. I will mention that after doing some testing in the practice range, you can activate Fortify at half your gun's heat capacity, and you can still shoot all the way up to your Fortify ends, so if you want to optimize your gun's heat, pop Fortify at around 50%. There'll be two main uses to fortify, which are categorised into defence and sustain, or soft and hard engages. For your defence cycle, or the soft engage, you'll engage with spear spin, shoot and or throw a javelin, and disengage with fortify, ideally at half your gun's heat level. Your javelin can also help with the heat reduction, and you can throw it anywhere in this cycle. You'll want to be doing this cycle if you aren't hard engaging into the enemy team. However, there will be times where you want to aggressively fortify for sustain, and this will be when you and your team are hard engaging. For for example, you can see Mirror spear spin aggressively into London's Reinhardt comp, and he uses Fortify to sustain and keep shooting afterwards. You'll want to do this if you think you're at some kind of advantage over the enemy team, which you want to press. These advantages will either be cooldown, HP, positional, or numbers based. A cooldown or HP advantage is pretty obvious. A numbers advantage just means that your team have more players alive, and a positional advantage can be difficult to spot. If we go back to the clip of Mirror and his team, not only does he and his team have a cooldown, HP, and numbers advantage, thanks to Sparker dying, but he's also at a positional advantage. London are all stacked on top of each other and are forced inside a small room, thanks to the May Wolf from King. London have nowhere else to retreat, and couple this with a cooldown, HP, and numbers advantage, Mira can hard engage with his fortify. Arisa's ultimate, the worst ultimate in the game.
Mitsurisa raise and spin her javelin above her head, pulling, slowing and damaging enemies towards her. Orisa herself deals 15 damage per second, and when she slams the javelin in the ground, it can deal anywhere from 60 to 500 damage. For reference, the minimum time required to kill a 200 HP squishy is 2.6 seconds, or 160% charge. I really wish I could give some groundbreaking advice on Terror Surge, but the ultimate is just so bad that on its own, I can't really say much. You could view it in the same light as Doom's Meteor Strike as a way of hard engaging to get your cooldowns back. In fact, Mirror does do this here, where he uses Spear Spin first, then his Terror Surge. However, he also pops Fortify just before he uses Terror Surge, which you shouldn't do, as when the Terror Surge ends, Mirror hasn't got Fortify available and ends up dying because of it. I actually believe Vancouver end up losing this fight because Mirror fucked up his Fortify usage. So ideally, you Spear Spin, Terror Surge and Fortify afterwards, effectively giving you roughly 10 seconds of Fortify. Alternatively, if your Fortify is on cooldown and the enemy team are pushing heavily into you, Terror Surge can also be a decent deterrent. The other use of Terror Surge is to stack it with any slowing effects you have. Again, in the same example, Vancouver stack Terror Surge with Blizzard and end up dealing a significant amount of damage onto the Spitfire. If they also stack Soldiers to stop the shot, then I doubt anyone from London would be moving at all. Now onto the playstyle, positioning and composition part. With playstyle, there's two main ones that stick out to me, harassing frontline or trading backline. I'll speak about this in the tank hero matchups, but essentially, harassing frontline involves using your cooldowns to put as much pressure on the enemy tank as possible, and trading backline involves focusing or dueling the enemy backline. Generally speaking, against tanks who you can punish, like a Doomfist or Reinhardt, you can shift into the frontline matchup, and against tanks who you can't punish, like Winston, you might want to trade backlines instead. Likewise, if you're playing against supports like Moira, Kiriko, Baptiste or Lucio, who you can't really punish, you might want to shift into the frontline matchup. But if you're playing against Zen, Mercy or Double Flex support, just like Spyro says, you might want to look to punish those heroes. I've already mentioned an example on Nepal, where Mirror trades backlines off screen, and I assume this is because Mirror can't really punish Reiner that heavily. Here's another example I got myself on New Queen Street, where I trade out 1v3 on the enemy backline and end up killing the Zen. Unfortunately, we still lose this team fight because my Genji couldn't follow up on the intention I was baiting, but you can see how the concept would still work there. With positioning, there's not too much I'd mention with the Visa. Corners are your best friend because they allow you to stabilize and get your cooldowns back, and you on Orisa rely very heavily on your cooldowns to do any sort of work. With compositions, Orisa is a decently flexible hero who slides into most brawl comps and can be a decent pick against Reinhardt and or dive compositions. However, her lack of mobility and team wide utility means that she can't really play with any dive composition. She doesn't really help contribute to angles that much and hasn't got any team utility like a Junker Queen shout that would allow her to play that rush style of dive. Now moving on to briefly discussing Orisa's matchups against the rest of the tank heroes. Orisa vs D.Va. This is a relatively neutral matchup. Whilst Orisa wins the frontline matchup thanks to her javelin and D.Va's big ass hitbox, if D.Va manages to get on top of Orisa's backline, that's when Orisa can feel like a bit of a struggle. If it's just the D.Va diving your backline, you might want to look to focus down the D.Va, but if it's a coordinated dive, looking to trade out backlines, like discussed earlier, would be a more viable option. Orisa vs Doomfist A favourable matchup for Orisa. Compared to D.Va, Doom's lower HP, lack of armor, and reduced movement speed when in power block render him a tough pick to play up against Orisa. Hit your javelins on him when charging up the power block, spear spin him when he's got few cooldowns left, and he should be an easy kill. Orisa vs Junker Queen. Another relatively neutral matchup, if not slightly in Junker Queen's favor. Junker Queen's slender hitbox means that the javelin can be quite hard to hit, and a well timed commanding shout can lead to you being run over. However, the spear spin disruption, increased amount of sustain, and the fact that Junker Queen can't as easily escape your terror surge, help even up the playing field. Orisa vs Reinhardt, a favorable matchup for Orisa. Despite having no shield, Orisa's disruptive cooldowns means that whenever Reinhardt pins or fire strikes, he's vulnerable to your javelin, and he can't land any damage when you spear spin, and you can fortify in reaction to a shatter. Just be wary of the enemy DPS, especially those Sojourn players who you might want to spend your cooldowns on instead of the Reinhardt if they're popping off. Orisa vs Roadhog, a favorable matchup for Orisa. Javelin hogs breather, spear spin his hook, and you should be good to go. Just don't fortify his whole hog. Orisa vs Sigma, a neutral matchup. Similar to D.Va, Orisa wins the frontline matchup, but Sigma wins the angles matchup. 
if you can utilize cover and map geometry to close the distance alongside saving your 4 or 5 forward accretion and your javelin force kinetic grasp, there's not much Sigma can do up close. But on certain maps like Circuit Royale, it's going to be tough to close that distance. Either force carts, utilizing cover to force someone to come in touch, or try and clear high ground using your spear spin on rotations. And for reference, you'd want to wait for your spear spin to come back off cooldown before clearing the high ground. Orisa vs Winston, another neutral matchup similar to the one against Diva. Even though you win the frontline matchup on Orisa, it can be harder to win it against Winston due to the bubble potentially blocking the javelin. As a result, you're left to try and trade backlines, which can work in some circumstances as long as your backline don't get rolled over. Orisa vs Wrecking Ball, a favourable matchup for Orisa. Wrecking Ball is just a tankier Doomfist at this point, you can get a decently easy javelin against a telegraphed pile drive, and you can spear spin ball if he decides to get too close. Orisa vs Zarya, a very unfavourable matchup for Orisa. Orisa's spear spin is basically pointless against Zarya, and you have no shield to help mitigate the damage against Zarya's beam. Since you lose the frontline matchup against Zarya, you have to take the angles matchup, meaning you try and dive the enemy backline, but if they're running Lucio Kiriko, have fun. Well that's the guide. If there's one thing you take away from this video, it's this. Unlike Kiriko, Ramatra is a fairly one-dimensional hero, being a hybrid poke brawl hero. This means that at the beginning of fights, in Omnic form, you will look to utilize the moderately high DPS from your Void Accelerator to soften up the enemy team, and then you look to close the distance and enter Nemesis form. Generally speaking, utilize your shield to suck up damage up close and to allow you to sustain the Nemesis form alongside using your projectile slow to aggress onto any enemies. A quick thing before I move on, I gave my script for this video to former Overwatch League coach Spylo, who made a ton of edits to perfect the script. Check out the stuff down below. Ramatra's weapon, the Black Hole V2, Mix for Martra shootout, small projectiles at 1500 RPM, dealing 4.5 damage per projectile, meaning Martra deals 112.5 DPS. Unlike other poke tank projectiles like Arita's gun, it also has no fall off. There isn't too much to note with Ramatra's weapon, other than the accuracy required to use the weapon in close range and up against squishy heroes. Pair this alongside the incredibly fast fire rate, which by the way, is the fastest firing weapon in Overwatch, and this means that you have to pace your shots when fighting up close and against hard to hit targets. In other words, you need trigger discipline. Don't just hold down M1 and pray that you hit your shots. A lot of Tracer, Soldier and Sojourn players end up doing this, and and they dump half their clip into thin air. Take the extra half a second to land your shots up close. Aside from that, you'll generally be using your Void Accelerator at the beginning of fights to soften up the enemy team before you then go into Nemesis form to deal damage at a closer range. Because of your slowing ability and the fact that you do deal headshot damage, you can look to hit headshots up close, especially if your Nemesis form is on cooldown. Speaking of your Nemesis form, Ramatra's alternative form, Big Ass Hitbox, makes Ramatra transform into a bigger Omnic with 150 added armor, lasting 8 seconds, changing your attacks into pummels, and allowing you to block incoming damage. Since your pummels and block are one-dimensional and work in tandem with your nemesis form, I will also couple them here. Ramatra's pummels deal about 60 damage, fire once every 0.6 seconds, meaning you deal 100 DPS, and it can travel through shields. Ramatra's block also reduces frontal damage taken by about 75%, reduces movement speed by 50%, and you can use it for as long as you want. The most important thing to note with actually using your nemesis form is the timing at which you use it. In short, just make sure you use nemesis form when you're up close. You basically keep the same DPS when switching forms, but now you gain significantly more sustain thanks to your armor and block. Speaking of your block, it seems quite intuitive and basic on paper, and surely it is considering you just block when you're receiving significant damage, but you can actually proactively use your block. In other words, look to block sources of big burst damage. A soldier and railgun, a soldier helix, Hanzo storm arrows, drunk at concussions, etc. It's really really easy for you to just turn your brain off and start pummeling, but good block management means you preserve more HP, and by preserving more HP, you can actually stay in the fight for longer, and therefore you can actually do more. Speaking of your pummel, try and prioritize squishy heroes rather than just pummeling the enemy tank. Especially in Ramatra mirrors, it can be really tempting to just solely pummel the enemy Ramatra, but if you can land pummels to any healers that might be behind him, like a Kiriko, Brig, Moira or Lucio, you might actually end up confirming a kill. Ramatra's second ability, mid, 
makes the marcher deploy a temporary 4 second shield that has 1000 HP with a 15 second cooldown. Now we start getting into the more advanced, complex pieces of kit from a marcher. Here are 6 key principles to help you use a marcher shield. Firstly, line of sights. This means that you want to use a marcher shield to block lines of sight from the enemy team. For example, on Li Jiang Night Market, set your holding point against a fairly common Winston Ana dive. When the Winston dives your backline, you use your shield to block the line of sight that the Ana has so she can't throw anti nades or sleep darts, and then you go to town on the Winston, pummeling him in Nemesis form. Secondly, Absorption. This means that you use your shield, similar to an Arisa shield, to tank a bunch of damage in close range. For example, on Rialto first point attack, say you're pushing the corner, you'd pop the shield on the corner and then switch to Nemesis form to give yourself as much sustain as possible. Now, if we want to go a step further, we can combine this usage with the previous one and place the shield between the Reinhardt and his backline. This way, you can block any incoming damage and possibly any healing as well. Here's an example of me actually doing this on King's Row, where I turn the corner aggressively and shield off the Hanzo Mercy Kiriko. Unfortunately, they weren't running Arno or Moira, so I couldn't block off any healing, but the point still stands. Do note that the main downside with this type of shield is that it could be easy to sidestep compared to if you just place it in front of you. Thirdly, rotation. This means that you pop your shield to move from position A to position B safely. For example, on Soka Royale, you pop your shield on high ground to block damage so you and maybe a teammate can safely move to contesting high ground. Fourthly, reaction. This refers to the usage in Ramarcha's gameplay trailer where he blocks High Noon. Essentially, you use your shield reactively to what's going on around you, whether that be a High Noon or a Roadhog cooking one of your key players, etc. The penultimate point is flanking. This means that you pop your shield to help you and your team control a key flank. For example, on Route 66 attack, you pop your shield by the lorry to help your team take that space. And finally, the D stands for dueling. Similar to Sigma's shield, if you find yourself in a pinch up close without Nemesis form, you can pop your shield by your feet and weave on either side of the shield to shield dance. For Marcher's third ability, extremely underwhelming, makes your Marcher fire a Nano Ball, exploding when it hits the ground, dealing 15 DPS, slowing movement speed by 40% in a 4 meter radius, lasting 3 seconds with a 12 second cooldown. Ramarcha can use this ability in either forms. There's two key uses for your Vortex, aggressive and defensive. Aggressive uses involve closing distance to keep range against the enemy team. Referring back to one of my earlier examples on Rialto attack, you could toss your Vortex to the side or just behind the enemy Reinhardt so it's harder for them to retreat and they have to tank your pummels. The other use of your Vortex is for defensive purposes. Again, referring back to Rialto, if the enemy Rhinoc comp just decided to speed straight onto you with either Speed Amp or Kiriko Alt, your Vortex could greatly prevent that. You could also use it as a peeling tool to toss onto your backline when they get dove, but the small 4 meter radius makes it quite easy to just dodge out of. If you don't know what peeling means, it's just a synonym for protection. You could also use it as a pharmacy counter, but as Flats discovered, the vertical height of the ability is just too low. Not to mention, the radius isn't very big, and would you really want to be saving a 12 second cooldown for a situation that might not even occur? Probably not. Ramarcha's ultimate does literally nothing makes the marcher enter Nemesis form, creating an energy swarm around him. It lasts 3 seconds, but the duration is infinite as long as an enemy attached. It also deals 30 DPS and is blocked by shields. Because of the relatively low damage that Ramarcha's ultimate deals, and that is the only effect the ultimate has, its usage is quite simple. Just pop your ultimate when the team fight begins. In other words, when you're up close and personal. For example, when you're pushing onto point on Nepal village, when you want to push onto point and take space, that's when you'd want to pop Annihilation. Using it at this time is kind of a win-win for you, because if the enemy team don't want to be in your Annihilation, meaning you gain some free space, and if the enemy team do decide to commit, they're constantly taking some form of damage, meaning you'll have an upper hand. You can also obviously sustain your Annihilation by blocking when enemies are right up close. You'll see this in a bunch of overtime situations, or situations where the enemy team absolutely need to touch points. For example, if a team want to deny the enemy team a checkpoint, that could be a great time to pop Annihilation. Another use is to extend the time you stay in Nemesis form. You can basically permanently stay in Nemesis form for the entire team fight if you first pop it, then you use your Annihilation, which should last for at least 8 seconds if you had good usage, then you pop another Nemesis form right afterwards. Just make sure that you use your shield beforehand, since you'll have a decent amount of time to where you won't be in Omnic form. Maybe you could pop Annihilation if your backline are being dove to deter heroes like Genji and Tracer from diving in, but they have so much burst damage that it's kind of not worth using Annihilation, especially if they've got some form of healing with them, and especially if they're competent at the game. Now onto Ramarcha's playstyle, positioning, and compositions. I actually think your playstyle is very similar to Orisa, which would make sense, 
considering you're both Pokeball hybrid heroes. This means that you'll either be harassing frontline or trading backline. I'll elaborate more on this in the following section, but essentially, harassing frontline involves using your cooldowns and high damage on Ramatra to put as much pressure on the enemy tank as possible, and trading backline involves focusing on dueling the enemy backline. Generally speaking, against tanks who can punish you, like Sigma or Reinhardt, you can shift into the frontline matchup, and against tanks who you can't punish as much, like Winston, you might want to trade backlines instead. Now, there is some complexity here, because normally trading backlines is a good thing, but with Ramatra having lower mobility than both Orisa and Reinhardt, he's probably not going to be chasing down a Zen in the back. So, to simplify things, if you are actually able to get on top of squishy heroes, for example, a Kiriko teleporting to a Winston, go for the squishies. But keep in mind that you might not always be able to do so. With positioning, just stick to corners. Corners allow you to stabilise and regain your cooldowns, there's no reason to not play around them. As Spilo states in one of his edits, this is important as outside of Burning Nemesis form, you don't have consistent damage mitigation. It's like the crappy Junker Queen mains who stand in the open and get their shout forced by random crap. And with compositions, just don't play him with Dive. Judging by the stats card I made for him, you can clearly see his lack of mobility. Instead, Ramatra has enough flexibility to slide into any poke comp, any brawl comp, or any mixture of those two. Now for Ramatra's tanker matchups. Ramatra vs Reinhardt, a favourable matchup for Ramatra. As of the making of the script, I tweeted out how much better Ramatra is compared to Reinhardt. Ramatra has significantly more range, and up close, he actually deals more damage than Reinhardt. His nemesis form has a higher DPS of about 12, a longer range, a larger cleave, and he can use a shield before he pops his nemesis form. The only advantage Reinhardt has is his noticeably higher sustain, meaning that before you close the distance on Ramatra, you want to soften up the Reinhardt comp from range to lower his sustain. Reinhardt vs Orisa. Again, a somewhat similar case to Reinhardt. Orisa has much higher sustain than Ramatra, but Ramatra has increased damage and slightly better range. Try and force out Spear Spin or even better, Fortify from afar, and then close the distance using your shield, slow, and nemesis form to crunch the Orisa up close. Just be careful of throwing your Vortex into a Spear Spin, and do be wary that Javelin can set you quite a bit back, especially when chasing down with Nemesis form. Ramatra vs Sigma, another favourable matchup for Ramatra. The only two upper hands that Sigma has is his consistent poke damage from range, thanks to his more permanent shield, and that you can't really do anything to his accretion when you're in Nemesis form. Aside from that, Ramatra deals a higher DPS than Sigma, meaning you can easily burn his shield, there's no question that Ramatra is the better hero. Keep in mind that Sigma's grasp also does nothing against your pummels. Overall, I wouldn't be shocked to see a lot of Ramatra on Soccer Royale to counter Sigma, because Ramatra is versatile enough to play from range, but to also engage in a rough brawl up close. Ramatra vs Roadhog a favourable matchup for Hog. Hog doesn't care about your shield, you have no CC to disrupt his hooks or his breather, and you don't have enough mobility to trade backlines. Instinctually, whilst making this guide, you might want to throw up your shield to block the enemy hook, but that's pretty difficult to do practically, and you'd be trading out an 8 second cooldown for a 15 second one. So in short, just hope and pray that their Roadhog doesn't flank, and beam him down with your Void Accelerator. Ramatra vs Winston, a favourable matchup for Winston. To help explain this matchup, I will first explain the Reinhardt vs Winston matchup. You see, whenever a hero like Reinhardt played against Winston, Reinhardt has enough mobility, thanks to his pin, to be able to trade out backlines or to peel for his team. Ramatra, unfortunately, does not have that luxury, and I think it's unlikely that a temporary shield, nemesis form, and a slowing ability will be enough to peel off a good dive. The only thing I will say is that if the enemy team are running a Lucio Moira or a Lucio Kiriko sort of dive, Ramatra may be a decent option because he has just enough range in his nemesis form to punish those healers who want to get up close to support their Winston. We just need more time to see how this matchup plays in practice. Ramatra vs Junker Queen, a slightly favourable matchup for Ramatra. Junker Queen's lackluster range and mobility give Ramatra the upper hand. You shouldn't lose from afar, and hopefully, you shouldn't lose up close. Blocker Axe Wing in Nemesis form, again, referring back to the point about blocking burst damage, and keep pummeling her from afar, and you'll force out her commanding shouts. Ramatra vs Wrecking Ball, a slightly favourable matchup for Ramatra. As long as you can survive the burst damage from Ball's engage with his pile driver, you'll be good to go. And perhaps consider tossing your slow when and where he pile drives. His large hitbox should make it easy for you to use your Void Accelerator, and if their ball goes for a lot of soft engages, as in he just never uses pile drive, you could either look to punish him with your slow, or trade backlines. Ramatra vs D.Va, a map specific matchup. In short, if D.Va can control a lot of angles around Ramatra, like on King's Road third point, you're gonna have a tough time on Ramatra. However, on more linear, longer range maps, like Colosseo or Lijang, Ramatra's range damage and solid sustain 
thanks to his block, can help Ramacha control space Diva wants to control. Ramacha vs Doomfist, a very favourable matchup for Doomfist. Not only has Doomfist been buffed to the wazoo, but even before the buffs, he'd still have a good matchup against Ramatra. Ramatra has no CC, his Vortex is dog shit, and Doom's high mobility and burst damage means Doom can manoeuvre quite easily around Ramatra. My, my advice therefore is to either try and melt the Doomfist when he engages, you're gonna have to buy some time in Nemesis form trading backlines, praying that their Doomfist doesn't kill anyone in your backline. Ramatra vs Zarya, a favourable matchup for Ramatra. Sure, if Zarya is on high charge beaming you down and you don't even have Nemesis form to block, you're not gonna have much fun. But in any other scenario, thanks to Ramatra's higher sustain and more consistent damage, he just kind of wins against Zarya. If she is on high charge, keep your distance and engage her with your Nemesis form, looking to block and draw aggro. Zarya's relatively low sustain means she can only be aggressive on high charge for so long. And that's it for the guides. If there's one thing that you take away from this video, it's this. Reinhardt is a low range, low mobility tank who is unbeaten in close range thanks to his high sustain, hammer and shatter. Utilize your typical Reinhardt mechanics like fire striking around corners, playing aggressive when you have armor and having a full shield when you engage to beat the enemy Reinhardt and to charge your shatter quickly. And when you can't play against a Reinhardt, be creative with your pin. Use it to hunt down enemy flankers, destroy the enemy dive tank when he dives your team and to clear high ground so that the enemy DPS can't get close. Reinhardt's primary fire, Torb's hammer but better, is a massive rocket hammer that deals 85 damage in a 5 meter radius that can cleave multiple enemies at once. Firstly, you can extend the range of Reinhardt's swing by turning your camera in the same direction that Reinhardt swings. The hammer also has a bit of knockback, meaning if you land a big shatter, you can line up multiple heroes. I will get onto more usage with Reinhardt's hammer in the playsole section of this video. Reinhardt's first ability, the Barrier Boy, is a 1200 health point barrier that decreases your movement speed by 30% and regenerates at 144 shield per second after 2 seconds of not using the shield. The most important thing that you, yes you watching this video, I don't care if you're Grandmaster, the thing you need to absolutely get down with your shield is shield management. Please, for the love of God, stop using shield for no reason, especially at the beginning of fights where you're not even using your shield to take or hold space. If you're not pushing or retreating as Reinhardt, don't use your shield. Careful, if you're shielding, you're intending to push. Right now, you are not put intending to push, so I don't want you shielding. Save your okay. resource, use natural cover, and now when you want to push, you'll have shield to play with, right? Yeah, okay. Like this is good here. I mean, you, you theoretically, I think could be sh swinging again here, but like, do you see how like this is really uncomfortable for them? They wish that the yeah. shield wasn't in front of them because you guys are actually pushing them. This can become especially important when trying to block the enemy shatter, and there's many clips back in Overwatch One where this easily costs team fights. Look how low your shield's getting. Your shield's low. So your shield's 1100. You go for another fire strike, and you've been above 400 health the entire time. So now in this fight, do they have shatter? Yes. They have hammer. And before the fight even began, you put your shield to 1100 HP. He's frozen, he's frozen. They've got hammer. Now with that out the way, here's six vital and fundamental tips to help maximize your shield management. Firstly, learn how to shield hop. This is simply done by jumping forward when you shield, which is done because you cover the same amount of distance in a shorter period of time, meaning you save some shield. The second tip is to stop flashing your shield in front of the enemy team for no reason. This can prevent you from being able to regenerate it in the first place and can really become damaging to your gameplay because if you're never letting your shield regenerate, you're never going to be able to go in aggressively. The third a more advanced tip is to weave in your shield throughout the brawl to block and avoid enemy stuns and to block key cooldowns. Thankfully, in Overwatch 2, there are a lot less stuns and there is one less hero compared to Overwatch 1, meaning it's noticeably easier to track key cooldowns. With that being said, you absolutely need to block things like Arna's nade and sleep dart, even with Kiwiko in the game, because a well-timed nade can easily lead to a lost teamfight. The fourth tip, which is admittedly more niche and quite old, is to utilize the angle of your shield to help guide your teammates out of danger. One of the things that you can do is if you're trying to shield from here, but you want to protect an ally while they're going into that room, use the angle of your shield to guide them into it. The final tip is that you can block infinite amounts of burst damage, such as Diva Bomb, even if your shield is extremely low. This is simply done by shielding as soon as the burst damage occurs. Reinhardt's second ability, Hellboy, 
is a flaming projectile that Rhinoc tosses in a straight line, piercing enemies that deals 90 damage. Rhinoc has two charges of this ability, each on 6 second cooldowns. Thankfully, Fire Strike is relatively straightforward. In 90% of cases, just Fire Strike around corners, because corners are the hot spots of the map, meaning that's where most players are going to be playing around. Here's a clip of myself explaining that. Sux quite usefully describes corners as hot spots of the map, where most players would be playing around, not to mention, Fire Strike in corners doesn't really require much mechanical skill. And of course, you also want to be casting your Fire Strike before turning a corner first, then tossing it after the short cast time to minimise how much your hitbox shows. Also, you can do a Swing Fire Strike combo, which gives you the most amount of damage in the shortest time possible. As a general rule of thumb, you should not be Fire Striking or even Swinging when you have no armour. This is because in Overwatch 2 especially, armour can be a safety mechanism or a plan B for when you do take a ton of damage when you do Fire Strike. Here's a clip of Flats, one of the biggest Rhinox streamers, Fire Striking when he had no armor, and you can see that he just gets obliterated. Rhinox's third ability, Kamikaze, makes Rhinox charge in a straight line for 50 meters in which he can carry an enemy into a wall. If he pins an enemy into a wall, he deals 225 damage, whereas if he just bumps someone during this pin, it will deal 50 damage. Rhinox can also cancel his pin. On a very basic level, a safe usage of pin takes into account two factors, distance and angle. Here's SVB explaining that. Like I said, a short distance, and considering that my team were very close, I had the payload for cover, and the enemy team was kind of far away, it's a pretty safe charge. The enemy Ryan, however, makes a charge like this. Immediately, you can see the difference in length. However, the other problem is that the enemy Ryan hasn't considered the angle of the charge either, and now finds himself completely exposed to lots of source of damage from lots of angles. Now this clip was made when Reinhardt couldn't cancel his pin, but you can still see people like Spilo, a professional coach, advising short distance pins to maximize safety. And to be honest with you, you could do something like a short pin here, right? He doesn't have rock, short pin him into the wall, shield up again afterwards. Because you are more bulky in Overwatch 1, and there's one less hero, and that you can cancel pins, you can actually afford to do more risky pins. More specifically, the pins that the best Rhinox in the world will suggest you do is to trade backlines, as LH Cloudy gives an example of here. And here, because I know that there's like two people in my spawn. Like two of my teammates just died here, if I just sit on the point, I'm going to lose. The fight from it from them killing two on our spawn, from me killing their Chen, and forcing their swordsman to go back all the way here. However, another usage of pin which is contradictory to what Cloudy says are peel pins seen in the Overwatch League. People like LH Cloudy have publicly stated that you shouldn't be peeling on Reinhardt, yet you'll constantly see pro players like Hardy pin straight into his own backline to help peel against the dive. So why is this? Why is there a disparity in the first place? Well firstly, let's compare the mobility of each enemy backline. In the examples LH Cloudy gives of trading backlines, he always pins immobile targets like Zen or Ana, but in the Overwatch League, you can't really do that because they're running a Lucio who will boop you away and speed away from you. The second main factor is risk versus rewards. In LH Cloudy's example, his Brigade Rally, meaning there's not a big risk in him trading backlines instead of peeling. The final main factor between trading pins and peel pins is likelihoods, more specifically, the likelihood that you actually land the pin on the tank. If you don't even think you're going to land the peel pin in the first place, you might as well trade backlines. There are also other factors like ranked versus coordinated environments, the competency of each player, and the map you're on, but that's the general gist of it, and hopefully that adds more detailed nuance to Cloudy's original points. You can also obviously pin cancel people off the map, just make sure you swing after you cancel the pin for the extra knockback. Reinhardt's ultimate, Earthquake makes Reinhardt slam his hammer into the ground, taking half a second to cast, travelling up to 20 meters and dealing 50 damage with a 2.5 second stun. An enemy hit in the epicenter of his shatter receives 200 extra damage. The most important thing with shatter is to maximise the probability of you landing it and to maximise the probability of you confirming a kill. Let's focus on that first part of the equation first. There are five main ways to increase the chance of you landing Shatter. The first is simple but specific. If you're playing against Reinhardt, play close and aggressive, using Shatter when he fire strikes. Ryan has two fire strikes now, so this should be easier than ever to do. The reason for doing this when he fire strikes is because Reinhardt obviously can't cancel his fire strike, and the reason for playing close is to minimise the effect of Shatter's travel time. You don't want to be shattering 20 meters away, only for that Reinhardt to eventually block it. 
The second way is to shatter an overextending or unaware target. This can be someone off angling or flanker focused on diving your backline, unaware of your shatter. The third way is to play dirty, as Spilo explains here. Don't fight clean. No honor. A lot of these whole mind games with Reinhardt and Shatter, they do matter in pro play, but a lot of the times, the Reinhardt that has the better Shatters is the one that just fights dirty. You use your team. You use your speed boost. You're gonna try and uh, flank shatter. I'm gonna turn this corner and shatter this Reinhardt. Don't, don't shatter the Reinhardt, shatter anybody else. And if you're gonna shatter the Reinhardt, ask for a sleep dart. The penultimate piece of advice is to tailor your shatter to each composition you're playing against. So if you're playing against dive, because they're gonna be quite split, you're more likely to land your shatter on a single target, as Iosox explains here. So now we need to look for smaller shatters. Previously, we could be very greedy. Now, shattering just one person is fine, right? If you can land a shatter on the enemy Winston, pin him into a wall and kill him, that's a really good shatter in this context. Lastly, be decisive with your slams to help maximize the number of people you hit, as I give an example of here. Like, as soon as he turns around here, as soon as you see this, shatter, shatter needs to be now. Like you have plenty of time to get the shatter there. He wasn't even he wasn't even thinking about holding up his shield. Like you could have easily, easily won this team fight, killed the Rhino and killed the Mercy, deny the res. Even if she gets the res, you probably still win this fight anyways. Your echo dies, right? Because you're too slow with shatter. You're too slow. Now onto the second half of the equation, maximizing the killing. The easiest way of doing this is just timing your shatter with when either team engages. Since your team is engaging, there should be at least one other teammate helping you follow up on your slams. If you have slammed multiple enemies, to maximize your kills, swing, then crouch, then fire strike. This should do over 200 damage, which means that you should kill any squishy hero. The reason for crouching before you fire strike is so that the bottom of your fire strike hitbox manages to hit enemies on the ground, and as mentioned prior, you also want to abuse the slight knockback from your hammer to align enemies in a straight line for that juicy fire strike. You can also use pin at the very end of shatter to help build some ult charge for your next shatter. Though if you absolutely need to confirm a kill on a single target, just pin them as soon as you've shattered them. So that's the main part to your own shatter. I do want to mention flank shatters. There's this old but gold clip I used on King's Vote in my 2020 Rana guide, which still hits. <laughs> My advice for flank shatters is only go for them if you absolutely need to. So if shatter is your only team's ultimate and the enemy have 5 ultimates, then I would go for it. I'll also mention some smaller details. Firstly, shatter can travel underneath and above the payload. Secondly, due to the cast time, you can be stunned or hacked during this animation, hence make sure you don't telegraph your shatter that you might get stunned out of it. Cooldown track both bubbles from Zarya to avoid accidentally shattering into a bubble. Lastly, only jump before shatter to shatter past the shield. Otherwise, don't jump, as this will provide a bigger window for the enemy Reinhardt to block shatter. Speaking of blocking shatter, the main piece of advice is that it's way easier to block a shatter if you anticipate it coming. Think of those Zen players who reactively use Transcendence in response to EMP. They can do it because they anticipate the EMP coming. The next question is, well, how do you anticipate shatter? And the main part to it is to roughly ult track the enemy Reinhardt and to adjust your aggression based on whether he has shatter. You probably don't want to go balls to the wall swinging against the enemy Reinhardt if he has shatter and you don't. Some psychological ways to block shatter is to bully the opposing Reinhardt with hammer swings, being prepared to shield his shatter. You can also feint by pretending that you're oblivious of the enemy Reinhardt, then quickly turning around once you anticipate the enemy Reinhardt shattering you. The last tip is to shield hop backwards to prevent the enemy Reinhardt jump shattering past your shield. Now onto the playstyle, positioning and compositional section. A vital fundamental is to clear high grounds to enable your DPS to use it and to disable it away from the enemy team as by explains here. Here's where the Reaper is. Ready? Three, two, one, go. If you path high ground and you find this Reaper, what is going to happen? He's gonna wraith out. He's gonna wraith out. You're gonna beat him with your hammer and he's gonna run away. Not only did you force his wraith, what did you also do for your team? You cleared space. Yes, that's it right there. You see how that's making space? <laughs> yeah. He wants that position because it's a good flank and it's a good corner. No hero in the game can match you toe to toe. You don't just walk down the choke and push the Sigma. Yes, that's technically creating space, but it, the most valuable space oftentimes is what's happening around you 
in a lot of these circumstances here. People like LH Cloudy actually played Reinhardt in this fashion, even going as far as pinning across high grounds as Reinhardt on maps like Gibraltar, because nobody can contest Reinhardt in this sort of close range. Another fundamental is that against dive heroes who are engaging onto your backline, you have three main options. Firstly, stand still and hold shield. Do this when you need to block ranged damage from Ash, Widowmaker, Hanzo, Ana, etc. Secondly, trade backlines with your pin, or thirdly, use your pin to peel and cause chaos. I've already talked about this distinction in the pin section of this video, but in short, if you can actually get on top of an enemy squishy, like a Zen, you can trade backlines, but if you can't really do that, then you might want to do a peel pin instead. They're playing a dive comp with like Kiriko Lucio, and there's a Winston jumping your backline, and then like a Genji on the flank, Tracer on the flank. What do you do? You hit him with your hammer. <laughs> Sometimes the best thing you could do versus a composition where you can't push something is to literally go around the map and hunt that Genji or hunt that Tracer. They dive your team, pin in the middle of your team. Catch that monkey, catch the Tracer, catch the Genji. Don't hit him, cancel your pin, just beat the crap out of them with your hammer. When we were playing Ryan comps, right, versus a lot of these yeah. Winston dive comps, Hadi played very much to try and disrupt and mess up the dives as possibly he could. He knew he couldn't shield a lot, he could shield a non and aid, but you can't even do that versus Securico. With positioning, there actually isn't too much to it. Stick to corners as much as you can, because corners allow you to regenerate your resources. Make sure your backline has line of sight when you push in, and don't be afraid to give up a corner or to retreat backwards if your team are at a disadvantage or vice versa. The main advantages or disadvantages will be positional, cooldown, HP, or numbers based. Other ones are like spawn advantage or spawn disadvantage, or who has the shatter advantage. Finally, the last bit of this guide, tank matchups. Reinhardt vs Winston, a neutral matchup for Reinhardt. Either block incoming damage like anti-nade as mentioned prior, or more likely, just swing your hammer at the enemy Winston or enemy flankers. As mentioned prior, you can see players like Hardy try his absolute best to outbrawl the Winston up close via the uses of his pin. Reinhardt vs Arisa, an unfavourable matchup for Reinhardt. For those who have watched my Arisa guide, you'll know that Arisa can basically stop anything Reinhardt can do. Her spear spin blocks your fire strikes and hammer swings, her javelin prevents you from pinning aggressively or even just closing the distance, and the cherry on the cake is that her fortify can block your shatter. However, you have a shield and Arisa doesn't, and you have more HP than Arisa, so on paper, as long as you can outlast the Arisa, and high damage heroes on your team, like Sojourn, can dome her Jupiter sized head, you'll be good to go. Reinhardt vs Sigma, a neutral matchup for both of the tanks. If Ryan manages to close the distance, it's over for Sigma, but if Sigma manages to keep his distance, then there's not much Reinhardt can do. If you're struggling as Ryan to close the distance, especially on maps like Soko Royale, you can look to use your pin to quickly clear high grounds, as mentioned prior, playing Reinhardt in a wacky manner. Just try not to get accretioned whilst doing so. Reinhardt vs D.Va, a similar matchup to Winston. Only difference I'd say is that because D.Va is more versatile and likes marking off angles more than Winston, look to clear and control high grounds early on to help support your DPS and to make the D.Va's life tough. Reinhardt vs Roadhog, a relatively neutral matchup. If you and Roadhog frontline, you win. You simply have more sustain, and if you block Hog's hooks, there's not too much you can do up close. However, Hog can easily fix this by just flanking and landing a hook, in which case, look to either match and mirror him, or to go on your own flank, hunting down those DPS targets up close. Reinhardt vs Wrecking Ball, again, a similar matchup to Winston, and arguably an even easier one, due to having no bubble unlike Winston. Punish Ball if he overstays his welcome, and I would definitely solo shatter him when he power drives. Reinhardt vs Zarya, a neutral matchup. Flats likes to describe Zarya as the off-tank Reinhardt, who trades out sustain for damage, which I can kinda see. Keep on closing the distance to Zarya to utilize the armor portion of your HP, as well as being able to land hammer swings. By being close to Zarya, you're also more likely to bait her bubbles just by the threat of being close, or you can do that with your fire strikes. Make sure to shatter her when you've tracked her using both bubbles. Reinhardt vs Doomfist, a favourable matchup for Reinhardt. Doomfist is just too squishy and doesn't deal enough damage to get past Ryan's sustain. Honestly, think about pinning Doomfist when he power blocks in the middle of your team and auto solo shatter him. He's quite a mobile target with respectable CC, but he's squishy enough for you to punish him easily, unlike Winston to a lesser extent. Reinhardt vs Junker Queen, a neutral matchup for Reinhardt. Junker Queen is unusual in that she can be close enough to deal damage, but far enough away from you to be unable to land hammer swings. So if you can bypass her lack of range and get close, forcing out her commanding shell early so she has to give space, she's actually not as big of a threat as you might think. Try and block her jagged blade and shield hop in rhythm to her scattergun shots to make it easier to close the distance. Well that's it for the guides. 
Hog is in a pretty rough state. His one shot is pretty much gone, and whilst the spam capability has gotten better, you might as well just play Sigma for spam. The death of his one shot also means that you can no longer solo flank as before, and that Hog has kind of lost his identity in Overwatch. The problem with the lack of one shot is Roadhog's identity is about controlling flanks, but if I can't hook one shot, then I'm like significantly worse at doing my job. I don't win every 1v1. But if you're really adamant on playing Hog, treat your hook like a CC displacement tool rather than a one-shot button, similar to Orisa's hole in Overwatch 1. Utilize your higher burst damage to bully close range heroes and exert higher point presence, kind of like a bulky Zarya without the bubbles, and look for small off angles to drag enemies into your team. Hog's weapon, the worst shotgun in the game, makes Hog blast 25 pellets of shrapnel in two firing modes, dealing 6 damage per pellet. His secondary fire makes him launch a ball of shrapnel, dealing 50 damage unless it detonates at 8 meters. They both deal up to 150 damage with a 0 0.2 second rate of fire and 6 shots in a clip. The main usage of your scrap gun now is going to be for consistent tank busting. Your DPS is on paper actually quite high at roughly 190, so keep short to medium sightlines to burst down or pressure tanks, especially those with large hitboxes like Ramacher or Reinhardt and to a lesser extent Orisa, and that's how you're going to be getting value now. The last thing to mention is your trigger discipline. It's good that you now have a better recovery time and more ammo, but especially against mobile targets such as Tracer, it's not uncommon for Hogs to completely whiff the anti-clip on them. The solution here is to just take an extra half a second to chill out and readjust your crosshair, as Barlow explains here. Zens have this problem too in close range duels against Genji. You will win so many more duels as Zen versus Tracer and Genji if you actually chill out and click your individual shots instead of panicking. Same thing with Roadhog, except it's even more important because you only have five shots and your fire rate's lower like that cog if he took a tenth of a second longer or a quarter of a second longer to shoot his shots he would have killed that tracer chill out that's my biggest foot uh, like like feedback for hogs that are struggling in those duels is chill out hogs fast ability basically an orisa halt now makes Hog throw a chain at the target, putting them in close range. The hook now deals 5 damage, has a cooldown of 8 seconds, and a maximum range of 20 meters. Let's get over what used to be your one-shot combo. Whilst you can't consistently one-shot with this in your games, it's still worth knowing to maximize your burst damage when you pull in an enemy. Firstly, soften up your target with a right click first, then walk forward and toss your hook. Walk forward during your hook cast time, and then do a primary fire and melee. Now, there is one big clarification with your melee. Most of the time, with the new hog, you actually don't want to be doing this. Thanks to the new patch, when you hook an enemy, they end up 4 meters away from you instead of the 3. And considering you have a faster fire rate, you also want to be getting that second shot off quicker. So, unless you absolutely need the melee damage to finish off a low target, don't bother with the melee. Still, even with all of this performed perfectly, you'll still struggle to one-shot some heroes based on hitboxes and distance. You can be cheeky against some heroes and walk a little bit forward before you do your primary fire, but if you walk too long, heroes like Tracer, Moira, Mei, Reaper, etc. can use their survival cooldowns to escape your follow-up. I'd also like to touch on crosshair placements. In short, you want to be aiming somewhere in the upper body region to maximise the amount of pellets hitting the heads. Here's a visual example way back in my old hog guides. As you can see here, Griffo hooks the ash without pre-firing, which is his first mistake. However, the more overlooked mistake is that his crosshair is not placed on Ash's upper body, meaning that half the pellets don't hit, which makes the Ash survive. There's also turning your camera after hooking, which can drag the enemy up to 45 degrees either side. Especially considering Hog can't one-shot anymore, and that you absolutely need follow-up to land a hook kill, dragging an enemy into your team just by turning your camera has the potential to make a big difference. You can also land some environmental kills with this too, so that's a plus. In terms of who do you hook, you hook people who you think are easy to kill and or are dangerous. Before, easy to kill just meant whether you could one-shot them, now that means whether you and your team can land significant follow-up on them, which is why tank busting is a bit more of a viable playstyle now. As Anima, a tier 3 coach describes here, Hook is now like an Orisa Holt back in Overwatch 1, but used on a singular target. You need follow-up to get the most value out of it. It's also disrupting ultimates with Hook, since, unlike Holt, it's hard CC. Saving Hook for Barrage, Blossom, Flux, Coalescence, or High Noon are obviously good ideas in order to shut down a potential play. Lastly, just make sure you have enough ammo to actually follow up on your Hook. Hog's second ability, the 1 second transcendence, 
makes her kill himself for 350 HP in 1 second with a cast time of 2 seconds. The cooldown is 8 seconds long with a 50% damage reduction during the cast time. Firstly, since Hulk's damage reduction actually applies throughout the entirety of the cast time, you can use your breather just before a massive amount of burst damage is about to occur. But the main usage of your breather is just for defensive reasons. Similar with Arna Sleep and Orisa Fortify, with them being defensive cooldowns, there's no better tip than to just not use it if you don't need it. One of Breather's main uses is to help Hog escape type situations, not to proactively use it. If you're feeling the heat, then use your Breather, not that complicated. One slight nuance is that if you're guaranteed safety, and if the fight is over, it might be worth letting your support heal you up instead for ult charge, as Spalo explains here. Big thing with Vape is you want to avoid using it if you're guaranteed safe and your supports aren't doing anything else, and your supports don't have ult charge. So Hog's ult is so mediocre, I mean, it's better now, but it's still generally inferior to support ults, so it's almost always better if you're safe and your supports aren't doing anything to let your supports get the ult charge from healing you, than you healing yourself. Hog's ultimate, the Terminator, <laughs> makes Hog cram a mechanical device onto a scrap gun, churning out a stream of shrapnel, having the potential to deal up to 900 DPS, lasting for 6 seconds. I'm not going to get into the niche animation cancels, straight onto the usage. Pressure relief. Essentially, if you're being dove, or if the enemy team are trying to walk onto you with things like Spear Spin and Lucio Speed, using Whole Hog can relieve a great deal of pressure and dish out its own pressure in response. Using Whole Hog against a Winston who just jumped in is pretty much a free kill. Linking onto this, Whole Hog also isn't a bad counter or displacement tool against Nanoblades. You're guaranteed to force deflect and you'll certainly buy time for your team to respond to the Genji. Lastly, you can use it to boop tanks or DPS into bad positions, or land environmental kills. But for the most part, you'll likely be using Whole Hog to finish off and or guarantee kills, thanks to the extreme damage up close. Now onto Hog's playstyle, positioning and communication. As stated prior, one of Hog's playstyles as being a solo flanker is now completely dead as of the removal of his one-shots, so that playstyle is in the dumps. Hog's playstyle now is more of a budget Zarya and budget Sigma, looking to spam and threaten decent distances like Sigma, but also using your thickness and high damage up close to bully enemy tanks. Let's walk through some examples. On Coliseo Neutral, this is where I think Hog would be best. There's not many flanks available, so you don't have to worry about trying to one-shot flankers, the midsection is very narrow and spammable, and most importantly, you have plenty of cover to use so you don't feed, and enough cover to walk up and brawl the enemy tanks. On Route 66 attack, you could play underneath the gas station, forcing point pressure and brawling whoever touches. You could also threaten enemies on high ground with your shotgun, similar to how you do so on another poke brawl hero like Zarya. And lastly, on the poor shrine, you weave around the central pillar, looking for cheeky hooks onto enemies down main or onto enemies to your sides. The main issue with Hog in these scenarios is that it's quite easy to feed. You don't have a shield unlike Sigma or bubbles like Zarya to help take space. Your hitbox is also galaxy sized, which doesn't really help either, but considering your one shot is gone, this is likely the best you can do for now. Now onto Hog's tank matchups. I'm going to split this up into the dive tanks being Winston, D.Va, Wrecking Ball and Doomfist, and the poke ball tanks being the rest of them. Hog into the dive tanks. Especially against heroes like Doomfist and Winston, you can really bully these heroes up close. Land as much damage onto the dive tanks before they actually dive to make their dive more dangerous, and look to bully them up close with your shotgun. Alternatively, when they dive, you can look to threaten the enemy squishies, as you would on a hero like Zarya, thanks to your bulk and more consistent damage. In this example, we can see Zarya pressuring in frontline with her Reaper, which forces gladiators to take a weak dive that the backline have a good chance of surviving, especially with the nano. Meanwhile, the threat of the Zarya in frontline stops Gladiator's backline from pushing up and following through with the dive, which buys the time her backline needs to clear the divers. Now onto Hog against the Poke Ball tanks. If you get outranged by heroes like Sigma and Ramatra, or the enemy tank lacks sustain like a Zarya, look to brawl up close. If you actually get out brawled up close by heroes like Orisa and Reinhardt, look to soften them up from afar before meeting up close. Have smart cover usage to regenerate not just your cooldowns, but also your HP pool, and good luck out there. Well that's it for the guides. If there's one thing you take away from this video, it's this. Sigma is a high damage, ranged duelist who can hold angles like no other hero in the game. 
whilst there is one less tank in Overwatch 2, so you might be tempted to stand main, try and look for mid-fight rotations and angles you can start to play as the teamfight devolves and becomes more messy. As of the making of this guide too, there's this quite broken tech where you can fire an accretion and immediately shoot out two hyperspheres instantly, deleting any 200 HP hero. Abuse this whilst you can. Sigma's primary fire, Ligma Balls, Make Sigma fire two charges, dealing 55 direct damage each, with a maximum range of 22 meters before implosion. There's three main things to note. First, the typical one-shot combo in Overwatch 2, mentioned at the start. Simply accretion first, then land two hyperspheres immediately after. Since your hyperspheres move faster than your accretion, you want to slightly delay when you fire them, so that once your rock hits, your hyperspheres also hit. You also generally want to be aiming at the feet of your enemies to effectively decrease the range of your hyperspheres if the enemies are at the very edge of your range. The reason for doing this is that it's quite hard to aim at an enemy if they're 18 or so meters away. So by aiming at the floor, your hyperspheres have to travel further, meaning it's easier to land some form of damage, whether it be direct or explosive damage, onto those targets. The second thing to note is that even though you don't have much mobility on Sigma, you yourself can do some pseudo scouting by abusing the delay in between your hyperspheres in order to look around, as contenders coach Nata explains here. So something you're doing really good and I want to identify it is you're doing damage and you're looking somewhere else. But this is something I, I want a lot of Sigmas to do because it'll help you with the awareness and scouting and understanding where you're sort of like looking like this. You shoot and you look like you look in another direction, right? He's checking main. Right, and uh, take this even a step further, right, is like you can go further out. You don't have to just like do short thing. You have time. You can go further out. You can even look the other way too. You can be a bit more open, right? In terms of general usage, even though you can't off-angle as much in Overwatch 1, you can still navigate to such positions in the mid-fights. For example, on Rialto second point defense, your team may be holding the stairs and the enemy team may meet you. Eventually, the enemy team will drop to cart, and here, you can look to off-angle on high ground, looking to even flank behind them on high ground, or if you're worried about cart, you can angle by the coast. Sigma's first ability, Super's Forehead, is a floating barrier. The shield has 700 HP, regenerates at 100 shield per second after being down for 2 seconds, and has a cooldown of 1 second after being recalled. Here's 9 tips which interweave tech and the usage of Sigma's shield. Firstly, make sure the shield when using your ultimate to prevent any incoming damage or from you being stunned out your flux. Secondly, angle your shield to block transcendence. Thirdly, use your shield to block off line of sight and healing from the opposing support in order to force them to reposition. This works best against Ana Zen as they have no mobility. Fourthly, learn how to shield dance against the mobile heroes. In order to do this successfully, just set your shield at a horizontal angle, then weave on either side of the shield. For the fifth tip, you can shield against Farah's Barrage, essentially using Barrage against herself as you'll see Xbox streamer Octotroph do in the background. For the sixth tip, keep your shield to block important resources such as Arna Nade, or in this case, Reinhardt Shatter, as shown yet again by Octotroph in the same game. For the seventh tip, you can cancel your barrier whilst using your Rock or Grasp. This will be especially useful with the latter ability as you can effectively rotate each cooldown in time. For the eighth tip, when playing Sigma as a main tank, make sure to only use your shield when the enemy comes into range and to not block irrelevant spam damage. 450 HP kind of throw it out, but it there's nothing really going on here, right? Actually, there's no one no one even remotely behind you. Your 450 shield goes to zero. Now they're actually in range to hit someone. That's why your shield is breaking because you're playing it a little, a little bit like a Reinhardt would play. Even though you are now the main tank and you, you will have to do the primary guarding job, you have to be a little bit more mindful. Sigma's second ability, the suck, makes Sigma absorb incoming damage and convert 60% of it into shields with a 10 second cooldown. There's two main uses to grasp, which is to either use it preemptively to gain a ton of shield or to use it reactively to absorb a lot of incoming damage, as Sparlow explains here. You want to use your shift as, oh my shield is broken, I'm going to use this as like a defensive cooldown to buy myself some time to regenerate my shield and or so I don't get instantly blown up. Or number two, you will you want to preemptively shift knowing that a chunk of damage is coming in. So for example, if you were to turn this corner here, you could just shift without even shielding. And they'd have a big load of burst damage, right? You get to like 800 HP, and then you could just use your shield afterwards as you needed to. But that would give you a big 400 shield just for free. Now that probably is not the best idea to do here because of hog hook, but it's something you could do. You could do it for a big burst of HP that you can use to play more aggressively. Because remember, you don't feed ult charge from Sigma shields. Or you could do it React. To finish off the grasp section, here are a few things to note. Firstly, grasp can be cancelled with your accretion, but you won't gain any shield. 
Secondly, you can reactively grasp projectile ultimates such as Zarya's Grav. To help you do this, Zarya's will often telegraph their Grav by walking forward aggressively and bubbling. Thirdly, in a Sigma matchup, just look to rock the enemy Sigma if he fucks up his grasp, it can lead to a free pick some of the time. Sigma's third ability, Rock V2, makes Sigma fling a massive debris towards an enemy, dealing 100 damage, deals a 0.8 second stun on hit, paired with a 10 second cooldown. In terms of tech, there isn't anything I haven't mentioned prior, aside from the 200 HP combo bug. For general usage, Accretion has three main uses, as a one-shot, which I just mentioned prior, as a failsafe, or as a stun. When I mean using Accretion as a failsafe, I just mean as a way of protecting yourself if a hero like Ramatra, Genji, Winston, Ball, or Reinhardt get on top of you, and as a result, you need to create some distance and deal some damage. If you're getting run over or dove upon, this might be a usage that you want to consider. Accretion can also be used to stun vital cooldowns and ultimates, which is best seen with Moira and Rodog, as you can save Accretion to stun Breather, Whole Hog, and Coalescence, alongside other ultimates like Cassidy's High Noon or Reaper's Blossom. There is also one additional use, which is for the knockback, using it to elevate yourself to high ground, just like Octotroph did in the same game mentioned prior. This is much easier to do than using as primary fire, although I would still recommend you practicing this in custom games. Sigma's ultimate, the slam dunk, makes Sigma lift enemies in a 7 meter radius, lifting them in the sky for 50 damage, then slamming them back down for half of their maximum HP. There's quite a lot of min-maxing with Sigma's flux, with one piece of tech that, at the time of my first Sigma guide in 2020, nobody even knew. The tech is essentially going underneath your enemy whilst mid-air during your flux, to make them land on your head instead of the ground. This may not sound like much, but this is primarily to counter Bap's lamp, as the vertical hitbox of it is simply not high enough. However, this can also prevent a well-timed Zarya bubble, an Ana using her nades, or now a Kiriko using her Suzu. For reference, try and do this on defense, as you are much less likely to put yourself in an aggressive position, as the enemies are coming to you, rather than you going to them. Aside from this, here's some general things to keep in mind about Flux. Firstly, use it as a repositioning tool. Get yourself onto high grounds and angles you previously couldn't have done so before. So for example, on Rook 66 attack, if you're stacking down main, you could flux and move onto the lorry to control that angle. Again, referring back to the beginning of the video when taking mid-fight angles. Secondly, abuse artificial cover from your shield or hide behind natural cover to prevent getting stunned or to just absorb damage whilst you flux. Notice that after you flux, your shield is here and this is sort of sparse natural cover in this area. Instead, you kind of gravitate towards, well, basically the open ground. You can see here, if we look at this perspective, how actually exposed you are and how easy it would be for anyone to CC you out of your ult. Thirdly, use Flux to kite away from a dive or a rush composition when they get on top of you. How do you kite as double shield? Well, Gravitic Flux is one of those methods. If you lift people, they can't move, they can't come any closer to you. It buys your team time, it buys them space. It may kill people, at the very least it forces out cooldowns and ultimate. Fourthly, you can use Flux to counter Nanoblade if you're quick enough and can predict where and when the Genji is going to dash to. By just by countering it, you will have made a huge play for your team. And it's actually not too difficult to do it to a Genji. All you really have to wait for is for him to use his first dash. It will take him at least a slash to kill someone. The final tip is a little bit of target priority whilst you are in flux, and to prevent tunnel visioning onto tanks rather than squishy targets. Remember, your target priority comes down to two things. Targets who are easy to kill, and or are dangerous. You're a little bit over-focused on the enemy Orisa. So you see, in fact, your first thought itself is just to go on the Orisa, even though you've lifted a Mei and an yeah. Ana. This actually, Ana's actually only lives because of the bubble from her Zarya, which could have potentially have been broken had you and maybe someone else been targeting it. The penultimate part of this guide is to do with positioning, which, as many of you already know, comes down to four general rules. Is Nata OW going through them on Oasis University? Playing this area right over here is just broken. You have distance from angles, so it's very hard for the enemy team to like come at you unless they come from behind, which still isn't that bad. You have insanely good LOS. You have very good rotation options where you can look to rotate more aggressively this way, like this way, go this way. You have such good rotation options, right? And then you've also got, so you got LOS, rotation options, and distance from angles. And you've got a corner. Whereas a lot of people tend to play in here, and the problem with playing in here is you don't have distance from angles. So instead of trying to prevent the engage, right, because distance from angles allows you to prevent the engage because you've got time so you can actually shoot the ball and shoot things before they get on you, right, when you're playing here, right, you're playing immediately to absorb their ball. With broader off-angle positioning, especially in the mid-fight when shit gets messy, look to rotate to off-angles in between fights, as Spyro explains here on Rialto first point defense. Hear that? What is that? It's a widow shot from a flank. 
Now you're gonna have two options here. You're either going to retake and just stand here in the core, or you're gonna actually go clear the, out the flank and start shooting them from the flank that you earned. Let's see which one we do. Still on the flank, still on the flank, still just shoot. Still just shooting shield, shooting shield, shooting shield, shooting shield, shooting shield, shooting shield, nothing to shoot, nothing to shoot, wasting our time. Oh no! There's a hog behind us! Oh, isn't that too bad? Where did he come from? Walk here, zone the widow out, go high ground, and start shooting them from above. Or shoot them from behind. Probably above because it's a little bit safer, but clear them out from high ground. Then sh go down this way and start shooting them if they try and hide here. Or shoot the widow that comes from here. So many options here, and you choose the worst option. Finally, to hammer this point in even more than I already have, and since at the time of this video, long range one shot heroes like Sojin and Widowmaker are meta, it's more important than ever that you mark the the angles that these heroes take. The Sigma is arguably one of the best, if not the best, 1v1 hero in the game. You could throw a shield right now and spam these guys, and they not only do they not do anything, they have to leave. Like, I wouldn't just throw a shield here, I would be shooting here, I would look, ask for Arisa for a rock here, and if and if we get, and, and what, what does that do? They have to back off, so what does that mean that happens to this Sigma right here? Is he getting healing? Is he getting any, is this Widow getting any picks? Is this Junkrat getting anything? No. This is precisely the fundamental reasoning behind why Sigma is played on angles. He has his own barrier, two methods of regenerating HP, a stun, high range to poke damage, and doesn't bleed too much orc charge. Now onto the final section of this video, tanker matchups. Sigma vs Reinhardt, a neutral and pretty rudimentary matchup. Keep your distance away from the Reinhardt at all costs, utilize your accretion and flux as deterrent for the Reinhardt closing his range, and you'll be good to go. Sigma vs Ramatra, a neutral matchup between the tanks, if not, slightly in Ramatra's favour. Be mindful of your shield since Ramatra can quickly shred it, try and keep Ramatra at a decent distance before he uses Nemesis form in order to soften him up if he tries to close the distance. Your rock should be an easy counter since Ramatra can't block it, and since your grasp doesn't absorb his pummels, look to use it more selfishly in one-on-one -on -one encounters. Sigma vs Diva, a neutral matchup between the tanks. Fortunately, due to your grasp and accretion, D.Va can't just boost a straight onto you and blow you up. However, she can abuse your lack of mobility by flying to angles around you that you can't control. Think Kings of Third Points. In this case, use Flux to control these positions in the first place and all trade backlines by fighting enemy squishies yourself. Sigma vs Zarya, a slightly favourable matchup for Zarya. Zarya does not give a flying fuck about your grasp, you haven't got enough DPS to abuse Zarya's relatively low sustain, and she has bubbles to counter your flux. Just keep your distance and strain her ability to gain high charge from afar. Sigma vs Ball, a neutral matchup. Ball can't just pile drive straight into your team due to your accretion. However, you can roll about, boop, disrupt, and duel your team. The goal here should be to absorb and live through Ball's engage, and to abuse the downtime afterwards. Sigma vs Winston, a slightly favourable matchup for Winston. Winston doesn't care about your shield, he can weave in and out of your accretion thanks to his shield, and his primal of zap doesn't care about your grasp. The only time you'll have fun playing Sigma against Winston are on long distance maps with few flanks, like Junkertown or Soko Royale, where it's pretty difficult for the Winston to get on top of you. Sigma vs Doomfist, a slightly favourable matchup for Doomfist. At the moment, Doom has been gigabuffed to god tier levels, but I assume he'll be tuned down pretty soon. Even then, you can easily kill a bad Doomfist by rocking a badly timed power block. But, if the Doom is competent, you'll have a bloody tough time. Your shield or grasp doesn't really do much, so you're really relying on your accretion to either punish the Doomfist or the rest of his team. Sigma vs Arisa, a slightly favourable matchup for Sigma. Sigma wins from distance, that much is obvious. But even up close, it's still a fairly skill based matchup. The key thing is to not get javelined whilst using Kinetic Grasp and to shoot at the squishies surrounding the Arisa. Sigma vs Hog, a favourable matchup for the Piggy. Look, you don't win in duels. You don't win from afar, and you don't win up close. Hog couldn't care less about your 73 DPS, and is more than happy to walk past your shield, and to hook you, and to force your grasp without a care in the world. Play your distance, and to burn the Hog if he tries to get close, and obviously rock his breather. Sigma vs Junker Queen, a map dependent matchup. If Queen can't get close, like on Circle Royale, it's free low. She has little mobility and little range, and can't really do much unless she hits some godly knife. But on maps like Coliseo, where you have to touch the bot on neutral, things can get a bit hairy. If she walks onto you with her axe and shout, you better hit that accretion. Well that's it for the guide. This is the best way to play Winston in Overwatch 2. 
Firstly, scout and set up your dive. To do this, just gain access to high ground to actually see the enemy team and listen to the sounds the enemy team are making to know what heroes to dive. You'll be wanting to dive targets who are either easy to kill and or are dangerous, meaning that you'll be avoiding tanks for the most part and looking for the isolated Zen or Arna in the backline or that soldier in his visor or that soldier with her overclock. And lastly, just get good with your primal mechanics. Winston's weapon, the Zappy Boy, fire an 8 meter range tesla cannon with an area of effect of 6 meters being able to cleave multiple targets. The cannon deals 60 dps, consuming 20 rounds per second with a full ammo capacity of 100 rounds. I'll also couple in his brand new alternate fire which makes Winston fire a 50 damage zap up to 30 meters. Let's just get your secondary fire out the way. There's three uses to your long range zap. Firstly, for random spam damage at the beginning of a fight. This is the least important use. The second use is before you dive a target. Essentially, to make your dive slightly more lethal, fire a full charge zap at the squishy target and then deal your jump melee combo, which I'll get onto later. And the final use is after you dive your target. This is when they'll get out of range from your Tesla cannon and you need to quickly finish them off. I will say that it's very important to get into the habit of using your zap just before you dive. It's a hard habit to get into and you'll even see me struggle to doing this consistently in the background. What should she be doing right now? Charging my right click. Right. Yeah. That's a lot of free damage we're giving up. And target acquired. What should you be doing right now? Right? Charging her right click. Charging her right click. Because even here, you miss her entirely, but you could have entered there with a right click. Now onto your main Tesla cannon. The fundamental use behind your Tesla cannon is to set up angled pressure on the enemy backline, with Sparrow detailing three levels and an example on Nambani. Your job is to control the enemy off angles or to set up an off angle yourself. Where do you set up your off angle chat? Behind, yes. If you can get behind safely or on an angle here, not directly in front of them, then you get on backline. And what that does is that puts, all, you are the angle. You are the DPS angle. You're putting, shooting them from behind, which forces, splits the resources and allows your angles in front of them to have more value. The level one monkeys do this, right? Why is this a mistake? Well, one, it's frontline. Two, my team can't see it. Level two monkey does this. Can my team see this kill box? Yes, team can see it, right? This is level two, but why is it not the best? Yeah, you're shooting tanks. You're shooting tanks and you're frontlining. Your team can follow up, but you're still frontlining. This is level three. And I'll do this all the time when I play monkey. I will drop off. I'll see Ryan shield get to about there or here and then jump on and I see and it's all squishies. And then my angle is this way. Their front lines go looking that way. And I set up an angle here. Let them come out and then you can get almost behind them here. Now you have to use jump, but that's okay. Cause you could jump, 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 jump and then drop like this. But the other level three possibility, it's a little risky cause you can get poked from point if they go point. Why is this level three? Different angle, exactly. Now you might end up zapping a little bit of Ryan. That, that's not great, but at the, you're on a good angle. You have good cover and for them to get to you, they walk into open space where your team can spam them. Winston's first ability, the jumpy boy, launches Winston at an initial speed of 30 meters per second, dealing one damage when you jump and up to 50 damage when you land. Despite Winston's jump just being a jump, there's actually quite a lot of nuance with it. I'll start off with the mechanical side of it first, then moving on to actual usage. I'll first begin with the classic jump pack and melee combo, where just before you land, you sneak in a melee for extra burst damage. Couple this with your long range zap beforehand, and you can deal up to 130 damage before you land back down. For the dedicated Winston players out there, I recommend loading up a custom game with a bunch of Arna bots at 35% HP to practice your combo, which should one shot those squishies. You can maybe increase the HP to practice this with your zap too. You can also perform a small skip by simply pressing your jump key after you land. Trajectory control is also highly important with your jump. Here's a clip from Carl Q explaining late and or early inputs with your jumps. The late input is if you input a direction after any of the three basic jumps from a neutral position. The early input is if you input a direction before any of the three jumps, so you're already kind of moving beforehand. Use the S key or down on the analog stick. Doing this on a late input pulls you back just a little bit, whereas doing this on an early input significantly reduces your overall distance. Lastly, you'll want to learn your vertical and horizontal jumps. Horizontal jumps are often safer, more lethal, but harder to goomba stomp your enemies with. I'll play a clip from Jane explaining the differences and again, this refers back to the advice on going into custom games to practice the accuracy of your jumps. So if you want to attack a McCree bot or something, you can jump vertically and then kind of like aim at them. But the other thing is that that takes 
way too long and it makes you more susceptible to damage whereas if you just learn your short jump so how long you need to actually hold the s button then that's more effective. The most basic yet fundamental use of jump is to jump to high grounds. I mentioned this at the beginning, but high ground allows you to stage and set up a dive because you can see what the enemy team are running and where they are coming from. This concept applies to D.Va 2 and Spyro gives a solid example here. Is there anybody else in the enemy team that's playing more aggressive or might be playing more aggressive soon? Do you see how hard it is for you to tell right now? That's why we go to high ground. Because as a D.Va player, you need to make that assessment accurately and quickly. And you cannot make that assessment with where you're at right now, can you? It's very hard to see. So you go to high mm -hmm. ground. Now what do you see? Or what do you not see? You don't see anyone on flank. No flank. There's nobody here. There's nobody here. There's nobody here or here. There's nobody here. Okay. At the very least, that gives you the information. Next, let's talk about jump placements. Just by changing where you land by a few meters can be the difference between landing a kill or being the kill. For example, on Oasis City Center, say you jump the soldier on high ground. If you jump in front of him, it will be very easy for him to just run away to the mega. Not to mention, you slightly boop him away too. However, if you jump behind him, the soldier has to walk through you, meaning you deal more damage. Maybe he even drops heal station too. There's also the jump placement for escape. For example, on Dorado's second point attack, say you want to pressure high ground, as you should. If you jump straight into the middle of the enemy team, you're giving yourself no options to escape. Whereas if you landed just by the edge, if there's too much heat, you can quickly fall off high ground and stabilize. There's also jump pathing. If the enemy team are running a brig or an ash, and are constantly whipshotting or coach gunning you away from high ground, stop running it down main. Take an alternate underneath angle and then jump from there. It will be a lot harder for the brig to predict where and when you're coming in from. Not only will you not get booped, but you also take less damage on entry because your dive isn't as telegraphed and you're being less formulaic. Here's Sparrow giving another example of your pathing when it comes to staging and setting up a dive. How should you be padding? You'd be flanking. Mm -hmm. What would this provide yep. to you? Just another angle. Right. If you jump the Sojourn here, do you see how this catches her by surprise? More likely yeah. to land, get landing damage. More scouting. Easier to see. Less likely to be punched out or poked out. Right? Let's say you're yep. going to go for Ana. You see it? Yeah. You're playing a hero that is absolutely atrocious in the tank matchup. It really versus every tank in the game, almost. The last thing I want to mention is using jump to engage or escape. If you can simply walk up to an enemy, sneak up on them from a flank, or drop from high ground, please do that instead of wasting your jump on cooldown. This is less so with Overwatch 2 now, but back in Overwatch 1, it was very easy to just burst down a Winston before he gets to the jump pack again, and even now, you don't want to waste resources if possible. If you're attacking, this tip may not apply as much. Winston's second ability, secretly the best shield in the game, makes Winston project a shield dome with a 5 meter radius, 700 HP, lasting 8 seconds with a 12 second cooldown. Starting with a general rule of thumb, you ideally want to be blocking cooldowns over raw general damage. Winston's bubble is not designed to block large sums of damage, so don't place it on a payload or in a choke. Instead, you ideally want to block cooldowns like sleep, nade, or damage that is directed towards you during your dive. You also want to try and bubble as late as possible against enemies who have their stuns on cooldown or don't have a stun at all. This will allow you to chase further without being punished as harshly. In combination with your jump skip, you can go quite the extra distance. Now with the shield dancing, this is simply weaving on either side or the opposite side that the enemy is on from the edge of your bubble. There's almost no reason to not do this, especially when drop engaging on the back line. In short, your bubble is intrinsically tied to your jump. If you're planning to hard engage or go all the way in, you're likely to use your bubble and shield dance to help you live. Not that complicated. Winston's ultimate, the most sane Overwatch player. Makes Winston refresh his health pool to 1000, with a 30% increase in movement speed, dealing out melee attacks that do 40 damage apiece with a 4 meter hitbox with a duration of 10 seconds. The jump pack cooldown also goes to 2 seconds. Whilst this isn't a conceptually difficult piece of kit to get your head around, the execution to pull off some of the key combos consistently is not only amazing game design, but one of the highest skill capabilities in the game. Let's start off with the hitbox and interactions. Firstly, your jump cooldown is refreshed at the beginning and end of primal. This means you can engage and disengage very quickly, so keep that in mind. Secondly, treat your swings like Reinhardt's hammer, in that you should turn your camera in the direction that Winston swings his fists in to extend the size of the hitbox to make it larger than it already is. 
on console, this can be hard to do whilst landing your jump perfectly and adding on top of this, you need to time the swings so that you don't boop them away from your landing damage. As a result, I'd increase your sensitivity drastically unless you don't find this a major problem. You can also easily jump over your enemy due to the 30% increased movement speed, so in order to fix this, just simply look downwards when you swing to smack the enemy in front of you. Now onto the primal and triple melee combo. Generally speaking, you should be isolating targets in your primal rather than causing general disruption, so here's CarQ explaining how to do the general primal combo and the triple melee combo. So, jump onto an enemy and use your Tesla cannon on them as soon as you get in range and make sure to combo it with a melee when you land. This already does like 50 to 90 damage with the basic attack plus melee plus jump pack landing damage. Then, transform to Primal Rage and use your first smack. You're then going to follow up with a low jump. Now, you use your second smack in mid-air around halfway through your jump. Then, you land from the jump pack in front of them. Then, use your third smack. 1. Use the first smack, which does 40 damage. 2. Start your second smack first, then use your low jump after, so that it makes contact with the enemy near the end of the animation. This gives you enough time to start the third smack just as you land before they get booped too far from the second smack. Next, learn how to corner juggle. When focusing down a single target, you'll often want them in a corner as they're easier to hit and focus, as well as you spending less time Time worried about movements. Here's Carl Q yet again explaining how to do this. Yakpunk suggests to always use your jump pack off cooldown to get the additional landing damage. When controlling them in a corner, he suggests to almost always use the short jump, but the key here is to always take half a step back before using it to ensure you land in front of the enemy. This is the key. If you ever use the wrong jump or land too close into the wall beside your enemy, you risk knocking them out of the corner, as you can see in this clip. In terms of broader usage, apart from isolating a squishy, other uses are to buy time, split the healers, store points, etc. Also ensure that you bubble before you primal, since you'll get your bubble back after your primal. Now onto Winston's playstyle, positioning and communication. I don't often include communication in the section of these guides, but for Winston, especially in a team environment, it's so important to call out when you're about to engage, and when you're actually engaging. And what should you be doing every single time you go for a jump like that on backline? Every single time, without exception, what should you be saying? Let's push in. Sure. I'm in in anything. I'd prefer a single word. Pressuring. Right. Diving. Going. Ready. Go. Yeah, jump. You know, any jumping. Sure. But your team needs to know because your team, while you're doing that, your team must at the same time burn their monkey or try and jump backline with you. Like your diva might come with you. You know what I'm saying? But you need to be at the same time. Same time. I usually call it three, two, one. I, I don't even think you can say three, two, one. I don't. I think it takes too long. I think you can just say, guys, ready, 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 go, and then just say go whenever you want to go. Because three, right. two, one, maybe you maybe you'd see an opportunity to go even earlier at like two. You say, oh, she just used Nate. We need to go now, right? I think three, two, one is, is a little outdated. Let your team know that you're about to go and then go. Regarding your positioning, high ground is a vital starting point, as mentioned earlier, so you can assess whether someone is isolated and or if they're playing aggressively. Here's Barlock giving an example of this on Oasis City Center. Let's say their Sojourn's just like positioned back here, and there's an Ana available also elsewhere. Would you jump the Sojourn if she was positioned here? when there was an Ana that's available like up here. Depends on how much of a threat she is. Like ooh, if I feel like this- Ooh, 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 ooh. Okay, let's stop right there. Explain, that's a very, very important answer. I feel like if she's a bigger threat to my team, then I might just at least soft dive her to force her back. That's a great guideline. Whenever we talk about Winston, it's not just about who you can kill, but like you talk about a good cooldown trade. Well, maybe that is a good cooldown trade if she's ulting or if she's going aggressively or if she's in a position to where if you don't jump her, she's going to kill your team. Now onto Winston's tank matchups. Again, just like with Wrecking Ball and Diva, I'm going to group these up into the Pokeball tanks and the Dive tanks. The Pokeball tanks being Sigma, Zarya, Junker Queen, Orisa, Reinhardt, Ramacha, Hog, and the Dive tanks being Diva, Ball, and Doomfist. So, with the Pokeball matchup, Notice how in each of these situations, barring maybe Sigma, you straight up lose the 1v1. You either have lower damage and or lower sustain, likely both. Just like with D.Va, you're often fighting for the space around the tank itself, and more specifically, the squishy heroes who are either isolated and or are playing aggressive. If you end up frontlining against a Nerissa, something is going wrong. Now, I do want to clarify, 
there is a time and a place for this kind of frontlining, and that's mainly to build Nano Boost. Alternatively, this could be when your team are running poke heavy heroes, or when you're waiting for a good opportunity to dive. Back in my old Winston guide, I called this slow dive, and some of it still partially applies now. Here's Barlow giving four general rules of thumb for diving backline in this kind of scenario. You're saying like, okay, he doesn't ever go deep. Well, if his Sombra was set up and they had a cooldown advantage, they would go in deep, okay? So you really only go in heavy hard in this composition because this is like soft dive, right? Because you've got like a pokey hero, you know, a really, really hard backline to dive and really only one hero that you can dive with. You don't really go hard backline unless you have one of three things, okay? A ultimate, ultimate. You have a significant cooldown advantage, not just like, oh, they don't have, you know, and they're missing an armor pack or there is significant positional advantage okay this is the only thing that you're gonna hard dive off of all right or like a numbers advantage like i guess we could say numbers as well it's like numbers or down one or whatever if they had nano fearless would dive back one if anna just chunked her nade if diva just used boosters and winston just used bubble you might see them hard dive back one, right because not being able to peel with diva not being able to their enemy monkey to trade your backline and not having nade for the enemy on it to heal herself means that you could actually die backline and maybe kill them positional advantage let's say the enemy team all rotates underneath and they don't even bother to clear you out up top like let's say that these see what these guys are doing they're fighting fearless why are they fighting fearless because if they don't fight fearless and they just stay with Bedosin, fearless is going to drop on Bedosin and try and kill him along with the rest of his team so they fight fearless so that they're not at a positional disadvantage they fight for this space because if you don't fight for this high ground monkey will drop on you so there's your positional advantage but they don't give fearless that positional advantage because they're fighting for the high ground so if the enemy team is in a really bad spot you can dive if they have no cooldowns you can dive if you have an ultimate you can dive other than that, you kind of you play it patiently until you see an opportunity. Now, what about other dive tanks like Doomfist, D.Va, or Ball? D.Va is actually more like the Poke Ball tanks just discussed now, since she can peel on like a Doomfist or Ball. Just avoid frontlining her and target isolated and all aggressive squishies as you normally would. Against Doomfist or Ball, you'll mainly be looking to trade out backlines to not only prevent the enemy tank from getting any healing, but to also create space for your own DPS to pop off. Well, that's the guide. This is the best way to play Wrecking Ball. You have three main play styles, to dive, duel or disrupt. You'll be diving enemies if you have dive heroes like Tracer on your team, and there's a mobile heroes like Zen on the enemy team. You'll be dueling as well for key areas on the map, using your text to give you the edge. And lastly, you'll be disrupting the enemy team by capitalising on opportunities where enemies are rotating, repositioning, or when you just can't dive or duel. Wrecking Ball's weapon, Machine Gun Kelly, makes ball tears automatic assault cannons apart at 1500 rpm with each shot dealing 5 damage alongside an ammo capacity of 80 rounds. The first thing to mention is ball's reload animation cancel as Yitala explains here. Technically you reload in crab mode after 0.95 seconds but you can't shoot until the animation finishes at 2 seconds. In other words if you want to maximize your damage per second you can do one of the two things. One melee or two quick grapple into fireball. Secondly, similar to D.Va, you can use your quad cannons to spine check for Sombras once the enemy team are setting up. Way back in the day, this is what Chengdu hunters had done against the NYXL on Nambani first point defense. The hunters also appear to be completely ready for the Sombra counterpick, as their composition is well suited to disrupt her. Wrecking Ball and Zarya both have lots of ammo for spraying and spy checking. Spy checking Sombra can disrupt the rotation and buy your team an extra 10 to 15 seconds off the clock. Lastly, let's talk about trigger discipline. This is simply taking the time to readjust your aim with melee when shooting a target in close range, as Yitil explains here. First, try and track as many shots as possible on the enemy, and when you're about to miss, hit him with a left hook. While this is happening, use the time locked in melee animation to adjust your aim. This single tip is so vital with regards to the dueling playstyle and making sure you win those out. So please, take the extra half a second to just track your target and readjust your aim with melee. Wrecking Ball's first ability, Lucio's beat on cooldown, provides Ball a minimum of 100 temporary shields, granting 100 additional shields per enemy within the 10 meter radius. The shields last 9 seconds, with a total cooldown of 15 seconds. Let's talk about using your shields early against CC or stuns. Remember we talked about how, I think this is the last VOD we did of you and I, Convald, 
whether you have to kind of read the situation and decide whether you need to pop your shields early with the anticipation of CC burst. Well, yeah, they're running Hog, but they're running Doomfist, who's dead, and Tracer. None of those are going to really burst you down instantaneously. I would not be afraid of waiting to pop adaptive shields when you need to. Because if anything, if Hog hooks you and pulls you in towards his team, you'll get a better adaptive shield there, and they don't have the damage to be able to burst you down. This adaptive shield, completely unnecessary. Now, let's be real. There's not much CC in Overwatch 2 compared to Overwatch 1, so you don't really need to worry about popping your shields early before being stunned. But if you're about to dive in Ana and can get decent shields out of it, still use your shields because the last thing you want is to die because you were too greedy. Aside from that, it's really important you don't overuse your adaptive shields. Keep in mind that you don't have to use adaptive shields every single time you engage. Ball players too often use adaptive shields when escaping shortly after using pile drive, which is a waste and increases your downtime by 15 seconds if you're just using your shields for the sake of it. Wrecking Ball's second ability, Batman's Grappling Hook, makes Ball launch a grappling claw, allowing him to anchor to an area and swing from it, gaining immense speed. Your grapple will automatically detach after 6 seconds. I'll also couple in your ball form, which basically makes you move at double your normal speed. When ball has reached at least triple your normal speed whilst in grapple, he'll enter a fireball mode, which deals 50 damage to any opponent who touches him, lasting 1.5 seconds. The maximum range for the claw is 23 meters, with a cooldown of 5 seconds. The first thing to mention is that you can do some third person scouting whilst in ball form. Here's an example on Oasis Gardens, where you can hide behind the corner and see any enemies coming towards you. Now onto the tech. I obviously can't include every single piece, but I will include the fundamentals. Firstly, you can b-hop whilst in fireball modes. This is done by jumping every time you hit the ground, helping you to maintain more of your momentum over time. Secondly, you can immediately stop your momentum by exiting your ball modes. This is just done to prevent you from walling off the map, or for you to start shooting ASAP. Thirdly, you can still perform the double boop, as the streamer ball explains here. To perform the double boop, start with a long grapple ahead of their position. Roll into them with fireball and boop them once. Tap S or down immediately to slow down enough to lose the fireball and then press W or forward to ignite your fireball again. For some reason, people think that you can't do this in Overwatch 2, but you still can, as shown in the background. Fourthly, learn the quick fireball. Quick fireball. Whether it be for speed or for damage, every baller has to get the basics right. Learn and master the timing and distance needed for fireball startup so that you can maximize your cooldown usage and end up with less awkward interactions where you're just smacking your ball against people. Fifthly, you can perform a wall jump and pile drive against slanted or flat surfaces as Ethel explains here. One, movement input towards the wall. Two, release movement input as you're about to touch the wall. Three, use the opposite movement input and jump. If you practice this enough, you can pull it off fairly consistently on walls you're familiar with. Next, learn what Yeetle called the Toronto Kick. Simply roll back, jump, grapple above you, and pile drive. Pretty easy, right? This does use all your movement cooldowns at once, so only use it if you need the pile drive damage. Here's another gimmicky name tech that I called the London Leg in my 2020 ball guides. Just grapple into the wall at high speed, then fling in the opposite direction as soon as you come into contact. This should give you enough height for a pile driver, then you can do whatever. Lastly, the 180 degree rebounds. Yet again, here's Ball explaining it. The 180 rebound tech is used to boop enemies without giving them a chance to react to your change in direction. It can be either used to boop them off the map or to boop them into your ultimate like so. To do this, step one is to grapple anywhere as long as it's not super high, unless you might start swinging. You want to be on the ground the entire time. Step two is to press W or forward into the wall. From here, there are two ways to do step three. The first way is just before you hit the wall, you let go of W. Then the moment you hit the wall, you need to 180 turn and press W again. Once you're moving again, you can detach the grapple just before you get fireball. The second way is just to press S or backwards when you hit the wall without the camera turn. This is good for people with low sensitivities or who play on console. Once again, detach when you're just about to fireball or else you'll spring right back. One of my favourite things to do is bait enemy Lucios or Balls near the edge and just hold down my power drive button. That means I can't get booped off the moment they boot me. Then immediately I'll 180 rebound them off a nearby wall and uh, hit them with the Uno reverse card. Ball's third ability, how to feed in 3 seconds, makes Ball slam into the ground, dealing up to 100 damage in an 8 meter radius 
launching the enemy in a locked vertical stance for half a second. And just like a grapple, there's a bunch of tech we need to cover. Firstly, the recovery pole driver. You can perform this by rolling off a ledge, quickly moving back, and pole driving. This is not only used to get you back to high grounds, but you can quickly pop this in a duel, and if you're fighting a squishy, you'll almost certainly win. The extra damage and CC lock-in should be enough to seal the deal, so learning this is absolutely vital for the dueling playstyle. There's obviously the minefield and pile driver combo, which is as old as time. You minefield in the air, then pile drive to suck in enemies towards your minefield, and also deal some damage too. You're basically guaranteed a kill on a squishy just by doing this. Now onto the most important parts, knowing when to not use pole driver and viewing it as a more opportunistic ability as amateur coach Lucid explains here. You want to think of pile drive as a more opportunistic ability. You want to use pile drive when you see these three scenarios. You want, either want to use it to finish off low HP enemies, relieve pressure from your backline if the enemy's posing a serious threat to it, or when you know someone can follow up on it. Like, for example, a Tracer, an Echo, a Genji. I would add a fourth usage, which is just pole driving when you can get away with it, and or in duels, as discussed prior. That clip from Lucid was from Overwatch 1, when there were a lot more stuns compared to Overwatch 2, but the principle still applies. You don't want to use pile driver and unnecessarily risk your HP pool for it. Kim Jong Un's second favourite weapon makes board deploy a set of long-lasting proximity mines which deal 130 damage per mine, lasting 20 seconds. Also note that each mine has 50 HP. There's four main uses to your mines. Firstly, to split the enemy team. Think of it like Dragon Strike and dividing and conquering from there on. Secondly, AoE fragging. A brawl team clumped up together would be a perfect time to minefield for a high chance of dealing serious damage. Thirdly, a solo ult. If you need to force trans or resources away from the front line, it is almost always worth solo minefielding. Lastly, contesting points. There have been many times, especially on Koth and now on Push, where the enemy team will play extremely sloppy and combined with you spinning around the points, a minefield can buy some serious time. Note that some of these points are not mutually exclusive to each other. The last point I want to raise is timing your minefield. As with any offensively used ultimate, it needs to be well timed to receive value. Many ball players, even in the high ranks, will constantly mistime their engagements. Perfectly timed. Good minds too. It doesn't need to get kills to be good. They're trying to go in and find value with this mine engage. They've committed to this fight. You go for like a boop play. You don't quite get it good enough. You preemptively Adaptive shield, which is good because the Kree hog, which is good. You mine, which is good. And then you get out of town. You've done your job. Like there's somebody on point right now. That person is by themselves. They're so split right now. Your team can follow up on all of this. Your Genji can follow up on all of this. Now onto the playstyle and positioning part of the guides. For those who've watched my old ball guides, these three playstyles do remain the same, but with a few tweaks. I'll let Spalo cover the three main playstyles, being the dive, disrupt, or duel, and then I'll add my own nuance. It's dive, duel, disrupt. You kind of break down the disrupt into like point pressure, boop, okay? Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? And obviously that's going to change depending on the status of your cooldowns as well. Like you're less likely to be able to dive or duel if you're down your adaptive shields, right? In addition, a lot of your dives were mistimed. This was a consistent theme. And actually your boop pressure was mistimed as well. So whether it was Genji and Spawn, whether it was you diving onto their Sigma instead of their Ana before they even push through, um, whether it was you rolling through them before they are even through the choke, you're usually too early. Like you wanna be like the fight is started now and you display their positioning. The enemy tanks have committed to the fight, then you dive there on them. And that, that screws them up because now they're already in a position to where they don't want to go and deal with what the heck's going on back there. They're looking this way. There's people shooting them in the face. And if you're going in first and they just shoot you and they clear you out and then they use their cooldowns on your team while you're going to get a mega health back, that's a 5v6. And you fed ult charge. As well as, you know, obviously don't go for your boop role plays if half of your team isn't even there or a member of your team isn't there to follow up on it and if they're not in a position to get boop. So with Overwatch 2, the main difference will be that you're dueling a lot more. I had a talk with some coaches I respect, and because there's no other tank in Overwatch 2, the bad news is that you'll have to cover more angles. The good news is that you're the most mobile tank in the game, so you can get anywhere at any time, even Yeetil said that in his own guides. So, for example, say you're attacking Numbani second points. You're playing against Honor, Mercy, Ash, Soldier, maybe the Soldier, Ash and Mercy are on high grounds. Ideally, if possible, you could duel the enemy Ash or Soldier, doing those recovery pole drivers we talked about earlier. If there's too much healing and you can't duel, no biggie. Go for the disrupt playstyle instead, looking to conserve your HP pool, doing roll throughs, and avoiding pole drivers. 
the goal with this option here is to get the soldier and ash to spend as much time looking at you rather than your team, whereas with diving or dueling, your main goal is lethality. If you of course have a Genji or someone to help you, then you could dive the Ash or Soldier, but that won't always be the case. I hope this example helps to illustrate how you can fluctuate between the three playstyles at a moment's notice. Finally, I do want to cover playing up against compositions with high CC. Overwatch 2 obviously has a lot less CC and stuns compared to Overwatch 1, but if you are playing against a composition like a Hog, Mei, Sombra, Ana, or any future heroes down the line, perhaps it's worth noting that you should likely lean into the disruption playstyle, generally avoiding pole drivers unless you have solid follow-up. Speaking of Sombra, what happens if you flank and she hacks you out of invis? Well, you have two options dealing with Sombra. The first is to take shorter flanks and to flank later into the team fights. For example, on Rialto second point defense, you start up by the stairs, and then when the enemy backline walk through the choke, you go for a pole driver, roll through, etc. A short, well-timed flank. Your second option is that you can still go for flanks as you normally would, but you need a tracer or another hero to come with you. Simple solution, but requires some coordination. Now onto the tank matchups. Just like with my diva guide, I'd like to group up some of the tanks into the Pokeball hybrid matchup featuring Sigma, Hog, Reinhardt, Ramatra, Orisa, Junker Queen and Zarya, and into the dive matchups featuring D.Va, Winston and Doomfist, since your playstyle against these heroes are very similar. Starting off with the Poke Brawl tanks. Notice how your mobility against each of these tanks is significantly higher. Abuse that. Look to fight for space and angles around the tanks rather than fighting the tanks themselves. Obviously, against the and Hog, you'll definitely want to be opportunistic with your pole driver to avoid being stunned, but here, you'll rarely be fighting them. If the enemy backline are squishy heroes, like Zen or Mercy, you'd be diving or dueling them, but if they're more slippery, like a Kiriko or Lucio, you'll be disrupting most of the time. The Dive Tanks this is a bit more complicated. Doomfist just has too much mobility, so you'll just be trading or diving each other's backlines for the most part. With Winston, you can disrupt his dive by booping him out of his bubble, or again by diving the Winston's own backline. Against D.Va, your playstyle will actually be more like the Puck Brawl tanks, because D.Va can peel, unlike Doomfist or Winston. If you dive the backline, D.Va's gonna be there to peel that off. If you dual enemy DPS, D.Va's gonna be there. So it all comes down to what the enemy team are running. Well that's it for the guides. This is the best way to play Zarya in Overwatch 2. Your bubbles are by far the most important part of your kit and don't use them just for charge. A good guideline for bubble usage is to bubble aggression, meaning bubbling your own aggression, the aggression of a teammate, or if you or a teammate are being aggressed on. Try and keep a bubble in the mid fight to sustain yourself and so you don't get run over. Keep in mind, the threat of bubble is what allows you to take space. If the enemy team know you haven't got any bubbles, they're gonna run you over. Zarya's weapon, the Brokey Beam, make Zarya fire a beam that deals either 85 DPS or 170 depending on its charge. She can also lob explosive charges dealing 47 to 95 damage respectively and they take up 25 ammo per shot. The most important mistake that Zarya players, including you watching this video, probably make is just turning your brain off and to default shoot at the enemy tank, especially enemy Orisas. Here's professional coach Temporal explaining why shooting smaller hitboxes is so vital and why only the top 1% of Zarya players actually do this. So I want to point this out because this is really important and I'm seeing a lot of people sort of fall into this trap of going tank shoot at other tank. Remember, the tanks give you 30% less ult charge, the tanks are never going to die in some of these situations if they have two supports available to them. You probably don't have the best tracking in the world of one that Zarya has actually wasted or used both of their bubbles, you're going to be better off shooting at any other target that becomes available. Even if the Zarya is at like 50% health, you're generally going to be better swapping off to the Moira that came in to heal them, swapping into the Lucio that came in to bug you to help their Zarya stabilize, or their Orisa stabilize, or their Roadhog stabilize, or their Reinhardt stabilize. You are looking as Zarya to swap past the tank to do damage. Not to mention, with Orisa, not only are you getting 30% less ult charge, but she also has armor, meaning you're dealing 30% less damage, and she has fortify, reducing that by another 40%. Hopefully, I've convinced you to not shoot Orisa all the time. In the bubble section, I'll have Temporal explain how you can just walk past the enemy tank, especially if they don't have CC, to then shoot at squishy heroes if you have a bubble available. Now onto the most common mistake Zarya's make with their gun, which is, while simple, is to stop reloading so much. 
So many Zaryas, including myself, will fire one right click charge and then immediately reload. This kneecaps the damage you can do over time, so please try and actually use the full 100 ammo in your clip and ensure you have a full clip when the fight actually begins. The, the, the quintessential Zarya error is to reload whenever you didn't need to. And like right now, 40 charge, 50, why the heck are you reloading? The fight is starting now. It's not like, oh, oh, the fight's about to start. No, why, why, are, you, why are you reloading? Why are you reloading again? <laughs> like, there's stuff going on! As Zarya, you also want to be interweaving your beam with your right clicks. This helps to maximize the ammo capacity that you actually have. The next thing to note is to maximize your 1v1 dueling potential. For the overwhelming majority of cases, you want to start and end with a right click and then use your beam in between that period of time. Here's Yisrael explaining the reasons for this here. The right click slightly boops your enemy, making their strafe easier to predict and their first shot slightly harder to hit. If you really catch an enemy off guard, you can throw in a melee right after the initial right click for maximum DPS. The next thing to learn is rocket jumping. This is done by simply aiming down at your feet, jumping, and as soon as you are midair, you shoot a charge at the ground directly below you. This is only done for mobility, either to get you back to the fight slightly quicker, or to reach certain high grounds, as Zetil does here. Six what else ground behind me? Oh my god, sorry, what the f my high ground. You can also do double rocket jumps by firing a load in the air, that, that, that sounds crazy I know, and then combining that with a right click on the ground to gain double the heights. After a one team fight, you can and should also push up and toss a few right clicks close to the enemy spawn for two main reasons, to farm grav and to retain your energy by absorbing spam early on. Zarya's first, second and only ability, the bubble, Mix Zarya emits a personal or projected barrier that shields Zarya and her teammates against incoming attacks, redirecting that energy to increase her weapon's damage. The barriers are 200 HP, last 2 seconds, and are on an 11 second cooldown. Zarya gains 1% per 5 damage blocked, meaning a total of 40 energy gained per bubble. I've coupled together both her personal and projected bubble since it's slightly easier to edit for me and the principles around bubble usage still stay the same. The most important and universal principle with your bubbles is the bubble aggression. Think about it. 90% of the time you whiff a bubble and get zero charge is because you either weren't aggressing or the enemy team weren't aggressing on you or your teammate depending on what bubble you use. So simply put, if you want to get energy on Zarya quickly, just bubble aggression. Now let's build off this further. Bubbling aggression isn't enough in Overwatch 2, and it's not good enough to just use two bubbles back to back to get 80 charge. The reason for this is because you can easily get run over because you have no defensive cooldown left. You're a sub 500 tank with no armor and a decently sized hitbox. Imagine if you also use both your bubbles, you're gonna get run over. Where bubbles become less about building charge, and more about controlling space. Maybe you thinking to yourself, well, if I bubble for charge, I'll get more damage. Well, the issue with that is, if you bubble for charge and you cannot push out and take space anymore, you lose neutral and you have to retake for your team, well, then your team can't play the game. You lose out on damage. You can't play the game, and when you're dead, you have zero charge. So, to redeem this, the play is to either gain 80 charge by eating a ton of spam from a distance, so that by the time the enemy team push into you, or vice versa, you already have a bubble back up, or simply, you just keep one of your bubbles as a failsafe when you're on decent charge, as Balu explains here. Like, let's say I'm like 75-80 charge, and let's say this is the enemy team. If I have personal bubble, that might mean I can go from this position over here to this position here. More aggressive, still cover, but like, let's say I do this. I'm on this angle and I just like walk in front and take damage to get from 75 to like 90 charge. This is the bad news. I got 15 charge, but because I no longer have personal level, it might not be safe for me to go right back to where I was. The enemy team might go, hey, that girl doesn't have personal level, and they might start to push me, in which case I have to back all the way back to this position over here. So the irony is that I have higher charge, but I'm doing less damage because I'm in a more conservative, less aggressive position. But the point being is that once you're already at a fairly decent charge, don't go looking for personal bubble charge. Play aggressive positions and sit on your personal bubble as a failsafe. So in short, being on decent charge but having a spare bubble allows you to play more aggressively because of the threats or safety of your bubble. 
In Overwatch 2, with one less source of damage, you can actually utilize this by walking past the enemy tank to damage the enemy healers. You're happy to ignore that, Zarya, and sort of dosy do yourself to here where you can melt the Moira. You do not care that the Zarya is shooting you. In fact, if you're still at like 100%, 80%, 70% health, you don't even care and you're just going to walk in and shoot at that Moira. You're not dosy doing in with your bubble to kill the Moira initially, you're dosy doing in with your bubble available and then you're using it to take out the Moira, the Lucio, the Sojourn, the Pharah, whatever is there. Now, obviously this isn't a good idea against all tanks. If the enemy tank has higher sustain, like an Orisa or a Reinhardt, and if they have CC, like Hog or Orisa, then I'd be cautious about this kind of aggression. But St. Paul is right in the general sense of being allowed to take more aggressive positions in the mid fights if you have a spare bubble. The only type of bubble I haven't really thoroughly covered are peeling bubbles. This is just when you bubble a squishy hero when they're being dove in order to protect them. This is fine to do, especially if they're running at least two dive heroes, but don't save your bubbles waiting for something specific to happen. Similarly, you can and should also bubble a teammate if they're being aggressed on. For example, if your soldier is on an angle and gets stuck by a Cassidy grenade, you better get that bubble. So hopefully that covers most of the use cases of your bubble. In short, bubble aggressively to either gain charge or to threaten a more aggressive position for yourself or for your teammates if you're bubbling them. Bubble your teammates if they're being aggressed on in a duel or if they need peeling. This will all depend on the enemy composition and I will get onto comps later in the video. Other things to note about your bubble is that you can clean status effects and counter ultimates such as EMP or shatter with it. Zarya's ultimate, the black hole, makes Zarya launch a gravity bomb drawing in enemies into the center from a 6 meter radius dealing 5 DPS and lasting 3.5 seconds. Firstly, a simple tip, but please reload before you use grav. The last thing you want is to go through a 1.5 second reload animation during a grav that doesn't even last 4 seconds. You're basically wasting half your ultimate at that point. In terms of usage, an underrated one is solo graving. Especially considering how oppressive things like Nanoblade is, one of the best and most reliable counters is to use grav after their Genji uses his first sash during his blade. It might even be worth solo grabbing a tank if you can guarantee their death, same with any backline squishy heroes. This is kind of how you'll be using grab anyways, looking to go deep and aggressive into backline territory, drawing a lot of attention to yourself, which should allow your DPS to do the heavy lifting. There's also the timing of your grab. Try and do this in the mid fight if possible. Not only will you be on high charge, but this is also because there'll be less cooldowns to prevent or stop the follow up of your grav, like an enemy Zarya bubble, a Kiriko Suzu, an Ananade, etc. Not to mention, Diva's Matrix or Arisa's Spear Spin will likely be on cooldown, decreasing the odds of your grav getting eaten. Speaking of getting eaten, just grab corners or payloads against Diva. Lastly, I'll talk about your grav follow up. If there's multiple enemies in the grav, the classic right click and melee combo is best to do when trying to do as much damage to as many enemies as possible. However, if there's a lot of healing, just straight up beaming the targets and then finishing them off with a right click melee might be best. Now onto Zarya's positioning, playstyle and communication. Starting off with communication, it can often be a good call out to just say bubble in 3 or bubble in 5 if you're playing Reaper Zarya or playing with a teammate expecting bubbles. This just lets them know roughly when to engage, meaning you synchronize your aggression together. Speaking of the Zarya Reaper composition, here's a voice cat outlining how the composition fundamentally works. Zarya can use bubbles on DPS like Reaper and Tracer in order to zone enemies or make a distraction that the core can use to push up into a stronger position or to clear split targets, kinda similar to how the Monkey Zarya comp is played in 6v6. This example here is pretty clinical. Reaper goes in with Bubble to draw attention and split backline LOS from the monkeys attempted to trade. This forces Bubble and Jump Pack, at which point the Zarya team can easily push in to exploit the enemy downtime. To add on to this, this isn't just with Reaper, it's with any hero that has burst mobility. It could be a Reaper TP, a Genji Dash, a Tracer Blink, a Symmetra TP, a Junkrat Mine, a Far Concuss, or anything else that can quickly help draw attention away from the front line and do those trades and splits which your voice cat was talking about. Now what if you're not playing Zarya Reaper, or if you're not playing Zarya like this at all? Well, you basically just bubble for yourself selfishly for the most part, unless you obviously see an opportunity for an aggressive teammate to get a bubble. Now with positioning, there's four general rules. Here's an example on Havana Second to help illustrate them. Firstly, you need cover. This is actually really important on Zarya since you need some place to regain your cooldowns. 
Secondly, you need LOS or line of sight so you can actually see and shoot the enemy team. Thirdly, and this is less important since you're a tank, but you need good distance from angles so you don't get snuck up on by a Sombra or a Tracer from a short flank. And lastly, you need good defensive and aggressive rotation options. This basically means you need to be able to escape or push up more aggressively, and this relates back to the thing about bubble management and having bubble as a failsafe when you're on decent charge. Lastly, moving on to tank matchups. Zarya vs Diva, a neutral matchup. In short, Zarya wins on the front line but loses on the angles. Obviously, Diva can't mitigate your damage and she hasn't got range, meaning if you keep your distance, she's forced to move. However, because Diva has more mobility, it can be tough dealing with her angled pressure, especially if she starts flying around you. In this case, look to bubble the people that Diva dives or duels and look to trade out backlines. Zarya vs Orisa, a favourable matchup for Orisa. Again, Orisa can't really do anything about your damage, but the mistake here is just tunneling onto the Orisa and not onto the Sojourn who's pocketed with Overclock about to kill half your team. Of course, shoot the Orisa if there's no other target available, but don't ignore the squishies. Zarya vs Ryan As Flat says, Zarya is the off-tank Reinhardt. Zarya trades out some sustain in exchange for higher damage compared to Reinhardt's. Don't get too close, even with bubbles as you can get run over, but aside from that, look to beam down the squishies around Reinhardt, keep your distance, even play high grounds if need be, and you should be alright. Zarya vs Hog A slightly favourable matchup for Zarya. Obviously bubble hooks, but similar to Orisa, whilst I know Hog is a big fat juicy target, don't just tunnel your beam on him unless there's nobody else to shoot. He won't die, he'll waste your time, so again, look for angles and rotations onto the squishies where possible. Zarya vs Junker Queen Junker Queen's slender hitbox isn't the easiest thing to track for lower players or people who play no aim heroes like me. Coupled with Queen's self sustain thanks to her bleeds, as well as her commanding shouts, a good Queen can chunk you down up close due to your low sustain as a poke ball tank. However, your bubbles counter her ultimates, and if the Queen doesn't take action with her commanding shout, she's easy pickings. Zarya vs Doomfist A favourable matchup for Zarya. Since Doomfist trades out cleave damage in exchange for burst damage when compared to his dive counterpart Winston, your bubbles can do a whole lot more for saving singular targets that Doom may dive on. Just be careful not to supercharge his punch early on. Zarya vs Ball, a neutral matchup. Most of the time, you won't even be seeing the enemy ball, and since a good ball never plays frontline, you can't really farm charge off him. If his pile drives are excessive pressure for teammates, consider using your bubbles on them, and in the meantime, look to draw attention of the enemy DPS, especially ones like Soldier and Sojourn, looking to force duels, and you'll gain energy that way. Zarya vs Winston a favourable matchup for Winston. Just like D.Va, Winston has more mobility, meaning he can get on top of your squishies and in places where you can't reach. His low damage also means you can't reliably farm energy off him, and his clear damage means that you can somewhat easily waste your bubbles. As a result, look to absorb his dive pressure and push it in hard after he uses his bubbles. A Winston after he dives is pathetic. He'll have no jump, no bubble, and will likely be on low HP. This is your time to strike. Zarya vs Sigma a map dependent matchup. Sigma will obviously look to keep as much distance away from you as possible, whereas if you're on top of him, that doesn't really matter. You can bubble through his accretion and he easily loses up close. Well that's it for the video.